Hello and welcome on in here to the BNB show. That's right. My name is Brandon. This guy over here to my left is Seahawks, Brendan Nelson. That's Brandon and Brendan coming at you tonight, continuing on through this rugged road of draft coverage, trying to find our way to the other side of it. We're almost there, Brendan. We're so, so very close. How are you doing this evening? Less than a week away, less than a week away. Our pick is probably less than a week away because usually the uh, first round doesn't take that long. So this Ooh. time next week, we will know what we did with pick 16 in all likelihood. Uh, you're kidding yourself. You know, he's trading out of the first round, Brendan. Come yeah, on. But now. Even, even that, even that's up. information. Getting their hopes up here, man. This is, this is false data. This we're giving them false, false hope. We don't do that here. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. That's very true. We could be looking at our pick coming down that line by this point next time next week. So hopefully you are getting excited because uh, it's going to be very interesting. They can go so many different ways, can't they? Just so many different possibilities on the board from Brendan. There's not that one player kind of, I think as we were coming along a little bit into last year, that top five pick, we kind of knew, okay, if the quarterbacks are gone, it's going to be probably a BC. Um, even though Witherspoon was a little surprising, it wasn't shocking necessarily. Now, with that said, we're looking at a position tonight, Brendan, that's going to be what I would consider to be right there neck and neck with the wide receiver class in this draft as being one of the strongest, if not the strongest in the class. It doesn't have the sizzle of the wide receiver class, Brendan, but it does have the depth, does it not? I I would say so. Like, I don't know if there's going to be a corner that goes in the top 10 this year. Last year, I expected there to be one. Now, there was one. It wasn't the one I thought it was going to be, but there was one. This year, uh, probably not happening. You don't have like a Jeff Okuda, even Okuda, I think number went number three overall. Mm -hmm. You don't got somebody like that, but there are like five guys that could go in the first round. There are five mm -hmm. first round corners here, I think, potentially. So it's no joke. And then I had like four second round guys, and then I had like six third round guys. It, it just, it never ended. It just kept going. And <laughs> I guess it just kind of makes sense when you have so many awesome receivers you need a number of awesome cornerbacks to keep the balance you do i think the thing you're touching upon is that we are starting to see some really upper line sensational athletes for the position over there as opposed to maybe what we've seen through some of these 10-year period with a lot of the off cover corners or just the big guys that can't move or that they try to press guys to death off the line lean on the loose college rules when it comes to the holding penalties that kind of thing now, Brendan, we're actually seeing some guys that can move in space, both quick and fast, and even a little bit of twitchiness on top of it, huh? Yeah, yeah, I would, I, I agree with that absolutely. It's, uh, uh, I ended up with thirty six guys that I looked at in total, so there's definitely some interesting skill sets in here, and I know there are a lot of people out there that don't really want to hear it. I know there's a lot of people out there who are resistant to the idea, but we might end up maybe needing one, you know. Let's cover that part of the road. Me and you were talking a little bit about this before the start of the show, and I think this is, is something that I we got, I know we got a, a, a ton of corners, so I won't belabor this too far, Brendan, but you, there is a lot of Seahawks fans that have a little bit of a revulsion to the thought process of drafting a corner because there's a little bit of, I think, a built-in, uh, you and I agree on this, a bit of, you know, well, then that means that that's the end of Tariq Woolen. Woolen's then going to be gone. Mm -hmm. And I get the, the understanding of this, but uh, – it's also one that you got to look through the lens of the new coach and what they want to do and what where they want to go with this. And the new coaches do tend to roll over roster. New coaches are going to look for their kind of player at all of the positions that they want, especially for a coach that's going to be a defensive side of the ball. That's his side of the ball. You better believe he's going to want his kind of corner, right, Brendan? And that doesn't mean that Willen's on his way out or that, that he can't be a part of this future. But it also doesn't mean that they're not going to maybe develop some starry eyes for a class like you just said that was very deep. Yeah, yeah, it's very important to remember that we, except for Carl Scott, who is the DB coach, I guess, mm -hmm. everybody else is new. Everybody in this building had nothing to do with bringing these guys in, except for, of course, the front office. But the coaches, they inherited all of this stuff. So I, I can say with a pretty decent degree of confidence that this coaching staff probably likes Devin Witherspoon because he's got such a great all-around game. It's uh, hard to not like Devin Witherspoon. So I'm sure McDonald's cool there. But after that, it's like, okay, well, he likes Mike Jackson enough to give him a $3 million tender. So mm -hmm. he likes him that much. But does he like him as a long-term solution? I, I don't know. Does he like Trey Brown? 
who doesn't really tackle all that well when we know that's what Mike McDonald likes. If I had to guess, he probably wouldn't be too excited about him. Mm -hmm. Does he like Kobe Bryant? Uh, Kobe Bryant barely played last year, and when he played, he didn't play that well. So maybe nobody likes Kobe Bryant right now. And where and is of he course, playing? Yeah, exactly. Where, where does he even go? And then, of course, you have the Reek Woolen part of it where – I, I think that he will probably be here this year, but I also think this is a very big year for him. I think this is a big year for him to start to define whether or not he is going to fit what this team is going to want to do defensively going forward. So yeah. other than Witherspoon, it, it's hard to know how this coaching staff feels about this cornerback room. So I wouldn't rule anything out. And remember, when Witherspoon came out, a lot of people said, well, he's going to play a lot of reps in the slot. And if that's the case, you could still have Spoon in the slot because most defenses are in nickel 70, 75% of the time now. And then you have two outside corners that you need. One could be Woolen and the other could be Rookie X. So I'm not ruling anything out. Yeah, I, I think all the points you make are, are the valid ones on this. And just on top of it, it's it's also one where a year from now, you mentioned the two players like Jackson and Brown, but even Woolen added in that mix is a guy that they like here. You've got to start to come to decision on these guys after a year from now. And having somebody on your roster that's set there so you're not caught in a pickle of feeling forced to have to pay somebody maybe you don't want to have to pay or attacking the position in a major way in a way, you know, where maybe it's a weaker draft that year. Maybe there's not as many free agents. You know, you also want to be a little bit having some foresight and looking ahead of where the position is going to be at a year from now, a bit as much as you can. Um, all the more reason why I think that this does open up the door very wide, Brendan, and with a high possibility because it is such a deep class of them getting a, a corner somewhere in here. I'm not advocating for it earlier. I'm just saying that uh, somewhere in here, and even a place like as shocking as Brendan is to say the top of the first round where we'll start, because though this might look like a uh, place that there's no doubt at 16 they would go for, you just said at the top, there's not going to be a corner taken in the top 10. I agree with this. And that does mean that there's going to be a decent potential that that top corner in this draft potentially could be sitting on the Seahawks doorstep come draft day. Yeah, yeah. I'm And, and look, my approach, and I'm being pretty firm here, is take the best player available. Take the best mm. player available. Figure out the rest later. This is not a great team right now. I don't think it's a bad team, but it's not a great team. This mm -hmm. is a team that can use a lot of help in a lot of different places. And I don't count cornerback as being something where we just need to, like the only position that I might completely ignore in this draft might be left tackle because mm -hmm. I don't see any way around the fact that left tackle is really sewn up here. Maybe receiver, but even then I would look at it and go, well, Lockett's going to be gone in a year. So Mm -hmm. I think we need to keep an open mind here. This is the time for an open mind with this brand new coaching staff. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So with that said, we're coming up in the first round at 16. We could be looking at the number one corner on the board. I'll be interested to see where you are. I haven't, I haven't checked with you in ahead of time to see where you're at with your number one corner quite yet. But let me start with mine and then we'll pair back to yours. And this would be a pickle for me if we're sitting there picking for all the things we just talked about, Brennan, lead up to this for me with this pick. And that this guy, I think, is truly the best corner in this draft. I do have a, a, a blue chip grade on him because I just love his game so very much. And uh, this would be a tough one for me sitting there at 16. But Quinion Mitchell, to me, is just awesome in almost every every way in how he plays. Uh, were you as well blown away by him, or am I uh, overrating this kid a bit? Yes, I, I am a big Quinion Mitchell fan as well. He is my number one corner. And he is a guy who I would have a hard time saying no to at 16. If he's there at 16, I would probably do it. And if the Seahawks do it, I know a lot of people will be unhappy, but I will not be among those people. Mm. Um, tested well at the combine overall. Um, six feet tall, 195 pounds. So he's big enough to play outside, theoretically. I don't look at him and go, oh, he's going to have to play in the slot. Um, arms are a little bit short, but uh, by the way, I'll tell you. The mistake I made this year mm. was I evaluated the cornerbacks after I did the edge rusher. So everybody's arms looked so <laughs> short because I had just finished with the edge rushers that all have like 34 inch arms. And then these cornerbacks have like 32 inch arms. And I'm like, wow, that's really small, but it's not. Well, to your point though, there are a lot of small arm cornerbacks though, too, in this mm -hmm. draft. So it's a little bit of also just not that pure natural shock to the system and a little bit more. We're going to have a couple of 29ers on here. Mm -hmm. I know, I know we got a couple thirties. I know we got some 30.5s, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Right, we do. So Quinion Mitchell, 
been incredibly productive on the ball these last two years for Toledo. And I know that's going to be a warning flag for some people. He played for Toledo. Um, had 37 passes defensed over the last two years. That is a crazy amount of ball production. Mm. And the interesting thing with him was when he was at Toledo, they played a lot of man and they played a lot of zone, but it was all off man. They did very little press. So some people were going into the uh, post season process thinking, well, you know, Quinion Mitchell going to be great in off man, going to be great in zone, but he doesn't know how to press. And then he goes to the senior bowl and he's pressing and he lo- he looks like he's done it his whole life. Hmm. So you don't even really have to worry about that all that much. So that's an exciting thing about him. His plant and drive, or some people call it the click and close is really mm-hmm. good. He recognizes routes before they happen and breaks on them. His route recognition is on point. He's stronger than the average player at the cornerback position, which is something I think McDonald might prioritize. And he probably has the flexibility to play a little bit in the slot as well. Um, The main issues I saw with him were he can get tricked by like double moves and fakes. He bites down a little bit hard sometimes. Um, His flipping of the hips is a little bit slow, a little bit segmented. So I'm I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I put him right on the doorstep of the top 10 for me in this draft. Yeah, he's uh, he's on that same doorstep with me as well. I just think he's got star potential. Um, highest rated cornerback by PFF the past two years. Not a, not a one-year-off, a two-year-off situation. I think he nearly tackles like a safety out there. He only gave up 48 total yak yards over the course of the season. So if you do make the catch on him, he is taking you to the ground and fast. I think he has everything athletically that you could want from the guy. 4-3-3, a 1-5-1, 10-yard split. Are you kidding me? With a 38-inch vertical leap. Uh, I love the guy before I saw the testing numbers, and I was like, man, I was, I was thinking he was going to be one of those, you know, uh, overachievers on the field athletically and what he's doing, but to know he has that, you know, baked in in what he brings from the skill set, I just think that he is – he, he checks every box and to be able to, I, I, I know that this last year was more of only one interception versus the five interceptions he had the prior year, Brendan. I think that was a lot of the quarterbacks just kind of not going his way this year versus the previous year going, yeah, it's trouble if you go over there, but you put him into a place where he's on one side and then you've got Devin Witherspoon on the other side, you're going to have to throw it somewhere. And those guys are going to mount up and get a lot of picks. They're going to play the run. They're going to be complete cornerbacks. They can play zone or man to the point you just made earlier. I just couldn't find much to really pick apart within his game, in my opinion. I just I liked it all the way around, and uh, he would be tough for me not to be pulling the trigger on him if Seahawks were there. I know, like you said, it pissed piss Seahawks fans off. I get that. Maybe you and I will be the uh, <laughs> people trying to be the psychologist come draft day and uh, get on our couch. It'll be okay. Just uh, tell us tell us how mad you are, you know. But uh, I, I'll like it too. So I, I love this kid. He is he is your number one as well, though. Clear and free, is, is it uh, free and clear your number one, or is it a close number one for you? Um, I never had any doubt about him being number one. That doesn't mean there aren't other corners in this class I like no. a lot, but no, no, he he has a decent leg up on everyone else. I think it's more to illustrate the praise of Quinion than it is to take down the others. I would say in that question, just mm-hmm. it's that he's that good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe. Let me ask you this real quick before we move on. Mm-hmm. Do you think he's a better prospect than Witherspoon? Not quite, but very I feel like close. he might be. He's, he's faster. Not, he's bigger. More he, ball production. Yeah, I, it's. It, I mean, I could maybe be talked into it. Let me put it that way. I think maybe part of what I like in him is that I think he's so close to Witherspoon, and maybe that's the hard mm-hmm. part of saying is he better. I think that what you're getting in here is a lot of kind of a Witherspoon clone. He's he's got the same arm length that Witherspoon had. He does test better than Witherspoon. They're both very super complete players. They can play zone or man. You can play them inside or out. I they just have more about their game that's similar than so I I just think they're pretty much at about the same mish kind of level. Um there was something about with Witherspoon in the way that like pros would talk about him. Former players would talk about him, wide re- former wide receivers of the sport would talk about Witherspoon when he was coming out. It was like, okay, there's something you're you're really in this guy's game is is just you know standing. You're speaking out about him in special special terms. I don't know if I heard that same stuff with Mitchell here, but I would put him in. If I have Witherspoon ahead of him, Brennan, it's by like a single strand of hair. Okay, I can dig it. All right, let's uh, peel on to the second one. What was your what was your answer on that one? You do you have Mitchell? You do have Mitchell ahead? 
I um offhand I I do. You I will admit, admit and you have to take him at 16 if that's the case. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I think I got to be on top of that. I mean, I was not entirely in love with Witherspoon last year because I was looking at him through that traditional Pete Carroll lens. Mm. So that probably threw off my initial evaluation a little bit. I was looking at him as a man corner who was a little undersized. I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. But obviously, with having seen his rookie year and how good he was for the Seahawks, I would answer that very differently if I had the information that I have now. But I'm just saying, looking back at what we knew last year. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. That's a fair way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. All right, well, here's my number two. And this may be a place we're already starting to go potentially find some disagreement here. We'll see on this one. Um, this is a guy I put at number two as much because of, I think, his fit to the Seattle Seahawks defense, this new Seattle Seahawks defense. He has come out to Seattle and visited the Pacific Northwest on an actual trip. One of those trips, the Seattle, one of those players Seattle has had out here in person. And he is goes by the name of Cooper DeJean, uh, Iowa corner, six foot and a half, 203 pounds, 31 and eight inches, 4.240 yard dash, Brendan on his uh, pro day. So I don't know if you had those numbers, by the way. I think because he didn't run at the uh, at the combine. Mm-hmm. Um, but very, very, very quick, Brendan. This kid is a fun type of player, isn't he? Yeah, he is, and he might be just what Mike McDonald is looking for when you think about mm-hmm. it. Um, there's a little bit of Kyle Hamilton here, maybe in his versatility. When the season started, everybody was listing this guy as a safety, and he probably brings a little bit of that versatility to the NFL. I think you could play him in a few different roles. Um, Last year, his production was stunted a little bit because he got hurt. I think that's important to note here. In 2022, when he played the full season, he had five interceptions and an 88.5 PFF grade. Last year, both those numbers were way down, but he was hurt. Um, Got good size, pretty decent size. Um, his click and close is really good. He's really good at like working his way through traffic when chasing the ball carrier, really powerful tackler. He's got great awareness. He, he, his ball skills are excellent. They're not on the level of Quinion Mitchell, but nobody is really in this class. I don't think anybody has better ball skills than Mitchell. Me too. Um, might struggle a little bit in man coverage because he doesn't have elite reactive athleticism. I don't think he has great, like straight line athleticism. That's why you see this 40 yard dash, this 10 yard split. The, these are all good. Um, he's less effective. The further he gets away from the line of scrimmage, I will say that I think he's better when you have him near the line of scrimmage and obviously the injuries last year, but I would put him somewhere around that middle to slightly late first. I like him a lot. Yeah. I'm a big fan of uh, Cooper I- as well. Um, he's the, I think he does like to say a little bit of the tight hips, which is on the, the transition and, and flipping and flipping the hips and, you know, getting on that stuff can be a little bit to, at, at times, not super bad, but just, there's a little bit there versus his speed, which and, and quickness, which you feel he's what I thought helped with him. Brendan was the five picks came last year. Sometimes at a cost to him on really finding a position and, and being able to settle in in a position. And he was used all over the place, which is great that he brings that versatility, but it also, just didn't let him just get comfortable and locked in in one spot. He did this past year, only gave up 20 completions on the season, barely any yak on that side of if you do make the catch on him. So he was just a, a very, very close, even in that injury kind of thing that he was dealing with to being a, a locked down kind of guy. Uh, so he is also a guy that with that prior year in playing safety, and I watched him play Sam linebacker snaps where they had him on the lo- on the ball uh, with the other two linebackers there, and he's down there playing it right right up on the line of ball. That's you know slot, uh, some free safety snaps from the prior year. They used him all over it. this year. They locked him in the corner, let him roll out there, let him f- you know fit to what he can do naturally at his best, and he was fluid back there to me. So I I love his upside ball skills. It's rare for the position. He's not a ferocious tackler. He'll do just enough in that realm of things, but still good enough. So a plus guy is a tackler out there. So even though I, I, I would say, even though it's not to that ultimate degree, it still is kind of like safety tackling ability you get from a little bit versus the corner, like some of the ones we're going to talk about. And there's a lot of them in this draft, let me tell you, who do not want to tackle. Um, that's not the case with him. So uh, a lot of upside on this guy, Brennan. Uh, you trade back 23, 24, bing, bang, boom. You, you jump on Cooper DeJean at that point. I would I would understand it. 
he can play understanding with these with with this thing i think he likes about witherspoon too brendan is that you have guys that you can start here and you can't say okay we're going to send you to this spot on the football field post snap which is going to be very unorthodox and normal teams aren't going to be like they'll never see the corner just suddenly shoot across the field like what is he doing you know he's just he's not even chasing the players you're like moving to a different spot but they, these are the kind of players, Cooper DeJean or Witherspoon, that can do this type of stuff. And it's a very specific skill that stands out in them. Mm -hmm. it, he just, he feels like a Mike McDonald corner. He feels he like a Seahawk. Like um, sometimes a team drafts a player and it just feels right. Like when the Ravens drafted Ed Reed, I think that was the greatest example ever. Mm -hmm. It just felt right. This guy oh, yeah. feels right as a Seahawk. And I know, again, this is another guy. If the Seahawks draft him, people will lose their mind. But <laughs> I'm telling you right now, in the long run, you will not regret having Cooper DeJean on your team because he's a he's he's a dog. He's an absolute dog. Plays the run really well. I like how good of a tackler he is. Mm. And he, McDonald would have a lot of fun with him. He would. And the variety of things you could do conceptually with both him and Witherspoon on the field at once would be tremendous. You know, give give McDonald more fluidity to move guys around, and I think the the defense becomes all that much more dangerous. I like your Hamilton comp too, just a little bit of a, sh a shrunken size Hamilton. He's not 6'4", mm -hmm. but same kind of thing that he can bring from a skill yeah. set part too. Yeah, and I think Hamilton probably has a little better reactive athleticism, a little bit. He can flip the hips a little bit better. Though he's a little mm -hmm. taller guy, so there's that belabored tall guy thing that you get with the hip flip, but he's a little more, it's the thing that does stand out with Cooper is things are a little, things are a little bit tight around those hips as far as that goes with the flipping and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. like, I don't think I was able to find the times, for instance, on his shuttle or his three cone. Maybe there's a reason for that. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's keep it on moving then now to my third guy. We're going to get some disagreement here at some point, folks. Me and Brendan won't just agree on everyone down the line, but we might. It might happen too. Uh, a guy couldn't get any testing numbers on. I don't know if you found any for him. Uh, no. Man with the coolest name in the draft. Uh, we got to give him that first. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your name's Kool-Aid mm -hmm. McKinstry. That's that's kind of badass. Okay, so mm -hmm. I'm I've got to give you the nod there. Uh, this is also a really, really, really fine corner, Brendan. Uh, really athletic kid out of Alabama. No testing numbers, but uh, before you get into your evaluation, do you like my Marshawn Lattimore comparison? Marshawn Lattimore. That does feel about right. I Whenever I think of Marshawn Lattimore, though, I think of him in the NFL where it felt like he got 7% worse every season. It was like some weird Blake Griffin voodoo magic where somehow his best year was his rookie year, and then it was just like a slow decline. It was oh, weird. Was Those Alabama corners came in, you know, Saban works them, Brennan. He works them mm -hmm. to the line. He works them from morning, noon, and night. So their bodies are just kind of spent by the time they get to the pro level sometimes. That's right. Uh -huh. uh -huh. But, um, yeah, I, I like him too. Um, I, this guy started the season as the consensus number one corner. Now he's mm -hmm. not even considered the number one corner on his own team. So <laughs> weird how that works out sometimes. Um, didn't have um, a stellar breakout year in 2023, admittedly. Somehow went through the whole year with no interceptions. Has won mm -hmm. over the last two seasons combined. Um, mm -hmm. But still played well. He's a good tackler. He gives effort in that area. He can do press man. He's got great quickness and lateral agility, flips his hips well when turning his back to the ball, which is such an important skill that a lot of these corners do not have. When they have to go from their back pedal to turning around and sprinting down the field, it sometimes doesn't look right. No. Um, does have some slot corner versatility, although he is big enough to play outside. I think he does have a little bit of a propensity for getting beat over the top. Bigger receivers are going to out-physical him a little bit. And it feels like he's not as fast on the field as he it should be. Like, it feels like he's giving up separation, even though he has good speed. It's mm. one of those weird things where maybe it's just, you know, it's one of those weird things where, like, you can have these receivers who build separation, even though they're slow. So it's kind of the opposite here. He's fast, but I feel like he gives up a decent amount of separation. I think good coaching is going to clear up most of the issues with him. He's only 21. That's another important part of this. When you're only 21, you have a, you're, you're going to get better. It, it's just impossible to not get better when you're 21 almost, it feels like. So I do think he's a first round pick. I put him in kind of the late first, but I think he's clearly worthy of being a first round pick. 
Yeah, I do too have him in a, in the first round. I think he gets in if gets taken. I think he's kind of a safe cornerback in this first round, Brendan. I mean, there's maybe some bu- bust factor to Quinn Mitchell, eh, Toledo competition, or some bust factor to Cooper DeJean. Didn't play enough corner to solidify himself out there. Here you got a guy that is a former five-star prospect at the position, a three-year starter at Alabama. And Alabama is not a place that you're going to go out there and start where they just get, they give you the kings to the castle. Oh, you're a five-star? Here you start. Guess what? The whole cornerback room is full of five-star players. You've got to earn your way onto that football field to get it. Um, I do see him as more of, like you say, a pure outside cornerback. 19 receptions on 39 targets this past year. So though the the, the the interceptions may have not been there, he certainly was getting it done as far as not allowing completions. Um, you talked about how he stays in phase off the press man situations, the flipping the hips in those situations, staying and running with. I thought that that was as well outstanding. I think he's got great field intelligence for the position. He just doesn't get tricked or fooled. Um, weird combination routes with receivers doesn't, doesn't throw him into some, you know, weird chaotic. I don't know what to do now. He stays with it. He's like a shadow and coverage, just a pure cover corner off man press. Um, only three missed tackles on the year last year as well. So you can rely on him as far as a tackler goes, Brendan. The thing with the interceptions though, too, I will say is that there, there's just, there's not ball skills. It's, it's not happening there on that front. Uh, you're not, you're not getting any picks from him on the other side of it, unless it's like a tip ball or a big overthrow. And he's just kind of getting to sit there and he can just kind of double clutch it there with the two hands. It's mm-hmm. is you're not getting it on that. So those aren't coming along. I mean, that's kind of that, that skill set is we've learned this long enough with plenty of corners who come through here, you know, your hands are there or they're not, it's uh, not, not going to develop with time or develop from college to the pros. Yeah, you're probably right about that. I, I think it does happen, but it happens rarely enough to where you can't really lean on that as some kind of a uh, thing that will bail you out. No, you absolutely can't. Um, and so it it does. And it does. That's this is why he's not a higher rated player. If he had ball skills and he had gotten those picks with what he brought, I think he would be a considered a higher player. But that is the place to me where if you have a corner where I can't rely on you to take away the ball, then I, I I'm or have any hope for it, then it's got to ding you just a little bit, not a whole, whole lot, but just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Did you you did have him as your number three here too as well, or did you are you buying the hype on the Tarian the Tarian train? Um, I I'm actually interested to hear what you said about Tarian because when I looked at him, I was mostly pretty impressed. I did actually have Tarion up there with Dijon and above McKinstry, but um, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about Tarion. Is he your next guy? He is the next guy. So I would say that if, if even though I do have the first the two, we do get to that thing where I always you know this is my little. Piccadillo, Brendan, where it just it comes down to when I got two guys that are basically rated on top of each other, trying to separate or say this guy's so much better than that guy or this guy's got that way up over the top of that guy. I don't want to make it sound like that um, because I still do like Terry Arnold as a first round corner and I still think that he's got a really good chance to be a solid NFL football player. There are, are kind of sometimes guys that just watching the way that they play the game, there's something that's a little bit out of sorts. And with him, it's a little bit harder to see because he is an outstanding tackler. In fact, maybe the best tackler in this draft. I think a big part of what I, I could say that is nice about Terry is that the floor is there and legitimate. He's going to be a really great tackler, you know, who can um, get some interceptions for you on the outside, bare minimum. Regardless of what, whatever he's doing in coverage, giving up catches, not giving up catches, he will provide you those two things with the five interceptions he had this past year. 13th highest graded cornerback by PFF on the season. So a lot of the outlying numbers here look very good. I think that when it comes to, and I know he's a hard worker as well. And, and what we hear about him, he did give up over about 400 yards this year. So mm. when he's over there on the other side versus Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid's not getting targeted. You're getting targeted. You're giving up catches. And I think that there was as much grabbing with him on tape as any corner that I saw in, throughout the process of this draft's process. And that is saying something because college does give you a lot. They get, let you get away with a lot more grabbing than you get in the pros. You mm-hmm. can sit there and just hold on damn near all the way through the route and they will let you get away with it. It's kind of wild to watch sometimes how much the refs just, just like, let him go, let him play. And he took well advantage of that. And he's not going to be able to lean on that skill at all at the pro level, in my opinion, Brendan. And I'm very worried that I feel like at sometimes I'm watching an athlete that can tackle and catch, but the feel of, of, of the timing of the position, the flow of your footwork, the pace the, the knowing when to transition and break your hips and get closed back out on the route that the, all of that stuff just is kind of doesn't naturally come to him. You know, it's a guy that can play guitar and he's hitting all of the, the riffs, 
but he can't just get you to the rhythm section point of playing through the through the, the normal part of the song, right? He, mm. He's he, he's doing the Guns and Roses, <laughs> but he can't, you know, just get to that the normal part where you got to, hey, I need you to stay rhythm here through the red, the normal part of the song, yeah. buddy. And he's like, I don't, I I can't. How you know? Yeah, um, I found myself being mostly positive on him. He's not fast, but he's explosive. He's got explosive moving skills, even though he's. And I think that's like one of the big fears with him. He runs a four five, which is not even, I mean, it's not average historically. It's certainly not, not, uh, not good by modern standards. Um, he's smart. He understands zone coverages. He's a good tackler. Uh, he's okay in press man. Although there are a lot of bad reps that he put on with press man. I think, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. How much do you think McDonald's going to want to run press man this year? Do you see him doing it? It all comes down to how much he's he wants the scheme to be fluid. You know, um, Winkman Wink Marndale will run a ton of press, especially when he's want to throw blitz looks up at you. But then last year we knew from McDonald is he ran a lot of off coverage looks. But then you and I talked about this. He ran the off coverage looks we probably believe because his cornerback room he couldn't trust as well on both sides. So you run the off coverage to give them that, you know, if you have a guy's a little slow and maybe he's best in zone, give him that extra seven, eight steps off the line of scrimmage so that he can stack and stay on top of the a route if it is a nine versus you put him up and press, you better be able to turn and burn. You better be able to run with that guy. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about Terry in that four or five, I don't know if he is four or five on the field. And, and a lot of the grabbiness comes from these college players where they're very fully well aware of these cornerbacks that they're not fast, these grabbers. They, that's why they're grabbing the guys up, the guys right to here, they're running, they're going, Oh crap. And then you see that hand come out deep into the route and it's, it's, it does relate right back to speed. It ain't like the guy shook him out of his pants and he's, you know, doing the, the grab to keep him, you know, from crossing him over. It's, it's simply the guys running past him in some way. So uh, that that's really where my worry is. I still do say the Tyrion's got a pretty solid floor. I think because he can still be that stuff clean. He can clean up the the, the grabbing. Number one, just it's a, he's leaning on it like training wheels right now. So just take the training wheels off the bike. He's going to crash a few times, but he'll eventually learn how to how to keep himself on top of the thing. But yeah, it is worry. It's worrisome for me nonetheless. Yeah, I feel like he gives up a lot of easy catches when he plays the off man too. Like there's mm -hmm. a pretty big cushion there. Which, yeah. uh, you know, maybe that's also because he doesn't trust his own speed. Maybe that's he's like, I don't want to get beat over the top because I'm not going to be able to catch up. It's like uh, the the end days of uh, Trey Flowers in Seattle where he was just playing 20 yards off every time. It's, good. it's a good relation. Remember how he just had that lack of feel like he just and he didn't kind of trust himself to your point. That's a, more than the grabbiness on the, the thing. I think that's that it's those two combos. It's the grabby and it's that natural feel for how to read and feel things. And, and I don't, it's not to say that I don't think he's got some good football intelligence, but it's just that he has just a, a guy that just doesn't feel, feel comfortable out there in what he's doing. And, and I don't know that there's the big room I see to grow on that. It's like you, there's things you got, or there's things you don't have sometimes for me on the football field. And if I see a guy that doesn't have something like that, I, it'll definitely stand out to me. And I'll kind of, as I said, put the highlight on him, like him here, where it's like, it's just not there, but that off coverage is definitely where it shows mightily. Mm. So I do think he's a first rounder. Maybe uh, I think if you're running zone, a heavy zone team, you could justify taking him in the middle late first. Oh, absolutely. If you are if you want to run zone team, if you want to run press and you're just like, look, uh, we're going to get safety help over the top. We're in a lot of cover two for you. Um, run your press. We're going to pull you off your hands after five yards. You're not going to have to worry about getting beat over the top because we'll have the cover two safety over the top to keep you clean the majority of the time. But just you're going to maul guys and play the run. And there, there's a scheme you can find for that. Certainly there's going to be some place that'll be perfectly happy. I mean, the Niners would love, might look at a guy like Terry and Arnold and love him if he slipped down to them. I mean, I don't think he would go, I don't think he would get past them if they were picking lane the first, as much as I know they want maybe a lineman. Right. Uh, Kevin Mullen. Thank you for the $5 donation. I appreciate you for that. I, Kevin asks, uh, how does the NFL measure arms? I think I got longer arms than T-Rex Arnold. Uh, question. Seriously, are you both hoping for a trade down? I want Chris Jenkins. Mm. Yeah, I don't know exactly how they do arms, but I'm assuming it's standardized across um, all players that they do. Be irresponsible otherwise. Uh, yes, they measure from the end 
of the bicep or shoulder blade to the tip of the middle finger with the arm extended horizontally away from the body. Mm, okay. My favorite is like, they would do this a lot in the NBA draft where they would have like, you know, details on a player prospect. They would be like, he can sit in the back seat of a car and <laughs> roll down the windows on the two, yes. uh, on the two front doors without leaning forward. That's my favorite way to measure arm length. It, it can scratch the underside of his foot standing straight up tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I like those too, man. Because it's as you get with this, you can get into these these same kind of terms as you're, you're writing down your notes. And I have to put a few things in there occasionally to sp spice it up a little bit, you know, where I'm like, you know, just put some wild thing in there to say it just to kind of like kind of throw throw a little bit of extra in there but it does well it helps it sink in right you'll remember that guy's long at that point oh, yeah. if somebody says something like that so um in regards to that thank you kevin for that donation but uh, also in regards to your question about trading down um mm -hmm. this is a pickle one for me brendan this is a tough con I, I get asked it a lot definitely kevin and i struggle with the question because on the surface of it i just want to immediately go yeah uh-huh mm -hmm. sure yeah but then it gets a little more complicated for me on that uh, are you the same way with that one? Um, I, I think it's going to be impossible for me to make this judgment until the draft is here. And then I see what's available. But I do lean towards a trade down because I think it's more likely than not that when we get to that pick, there's not going to be anybody that I'm super over the top with. Um, yeah. You know, like we talk about Bowers. I, I just feel like at the end of the day, Bowers doesn't get past 11 or 12. Agreed. Um, you know, some people are talking about six quarterbacks going in the top 15. Uh, I feel like this whole JJ McCarthy thing is a smoke screen and he's not even going to go in the first. I feel like people are just messing with us. I, I can't believe that's actually going to happen. So it's, Brendan, it's happening. It's happening, man. There's I, if this doesn't go with him going in this first, in this top of the 15 picks with this much that's been put behind him and it ain't fans pushing this Brendan. That's the thing with this whole McCarthy thing. It ain't Michigan, you know, honks out there trying to just, you know, Michigan's the best. So McCarthy should be taken. This is NFL personnel people. This is former NFL personnel people. This is former scouts talking about this from what they're hearing from within inside NFL circles. So if this is that smoke screen, this is one of the biggest smoke screens I've ever seen. This is four smokes being thrown down in, in cod type smoke screen levels at once. So, I, 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 it's happening to me. I think you're in disbelief because your assessment of McCarthy is so far off of where you, you can believe him going. And it's maybe going to, you're going to look at this and I'm not trying to speak for you, but you'll look at this in retrospect. If it is picked at five, if he goes at four or five, you're looking at that pick going, that's maybe one of the highest overdrafts for a quarterback I've ever seen in my lifetime. Yeah. And it would be one thing if there weren't enough quarterbacks in this draft, but that's not the case at all. Like when you see something like, when, when you see that quarterback that gets boosted up the boards at the last second, mm -hmm. it's usually because like, oh, there were only two quarterbacks in the top 10. We needed another one. Like mm -hmm. that's kind of what happened with Jay Cutler. That's kind of what happened with Ryan Tannehill. They needed another quarterback. That's mm -hmm. not the case this year. There are so many quarterbacks that are, I suspect, going to go in that top 15. You didn't need to force another one. So I don't get it either. I mean, you do make a good point. I, I, I don't know. I just expect to get to draft day and then everybody just kind of realizes that, um, <laughs> you know, he he doesn't really have the only thing he has is his winning percentage, which I mean, Max Dugan had that right. Max well, Dugan beat J.J. McCarthy. It's got his third down completion percentage, Brendan. Come on. Don't undersell mm -hmm. that, too. He's yeah. got the third down completion percentage. Yeah. It's a sample size can third down completion percentage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's, he's uh, you know, uh, Desmond Ritter had that. Desmond Ritter never lost in college, pretty yeah. much. He lost, like, two games. So, yeah. I don't know. Part of me is still expecting people to, like, snap into focus and realize, wait a minute here. But uh, you're, you're probably right. Like, what, what's uh, – I know he's better than Ken Dorsey, but what really separates J.J. McCarthy from somebody like Ken Dorsey? I, I don't think it's that big of a discrepancy. So, I'm just waiting for people to realize that. Yeah, I, I, number one, I, I'm with you 100% in your outlook of the player. You know, you know that with me. And I, I, it, it's shocking to me that this is getting here. But I, I also had this happen to me with Mac Jones a couple of years ago. So I guess this is, that's, this is make for me my Mac Jones lesson. 
where I, I looked at Mac Jones and you know, I remember I would, I was ready to laugh my happy, happy butt off. If the Niners were going to take him, I was going to be so happy if they were doing that. Um, because it, it, he's not that good. And another guy comes from you know, winning from the program, Alabama, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where the NFL tricks itself into these guys. And because you're no longer like you were 20 years ago, paying quarterbacks a hundred million dollars coming out the gate and having to throw them that big of a contract, the squeeze is worth the risk. You know, it's okay. It don't work. We flip it around. We go back, get a quarterback in a couple of years, whatever. But if we hit, Oh my God, it's, it's one of those worthwhile risks that you take. And, and in regards to your question, you know, it really doesn't come down to like, there's so many quarterbacks in this draft. Why you go to McCarthy? Because three are gone. Three are bye-bye. Yeah. They, they, so it, it's really then about Knicks, Penix, and McCarthy. And mm -hmm. wherever your evaluation stands on any of those three guys, Brendan, there is a wide difference of the type of player each and every one of those three guys is. And I only say that because we know the NFL has its predilections to each team kind of having their own personal little taste for that, for that kind of player that they like. And um, that's to me where it's, you know, Giants went for Daniel Jones a couple years ago. I looked at Daniel Jones coming out. They went, what are you doing? Like people are going paid Manning. I go, in what universe are you making a paid Manning comparison to that googly eyed? Uh, how? How? You know? Um, but this happens. These the teams get this stuff wrong. And it's just, it's wild to watch. But it's also fun because we're going to be able to benefit on the back of this, Brendan. Right. But anyway, to go back to the original point, I feel like there's going to be a big pivot point when the Jets pick because the Jets, they could take Bowers. Mm. They could take Fatanu. They could take Fashanu. I, I think that's going to be the interesting one. I think that's kind of the uh, thing to wonder. Who do the yeah. Jets want at left tackle? Do they want Fatanu or Fashanu? Who do they think is better? Mm. If the Jets take Fashanu, I feel like Fatanu has a real chance of falling to us. Mm -hmm. And that would be something I would be ready to jump on at 16, no problem. Sure. If Fatanu goes, then that might create an effect where by the time the pick gets down to us, there's not much there that I'm super compelled by. That's where you got to the heart of the question for me on that. That is the hard part for me to answer on this, Kevin. And it's went a long way around on this. Sorry about that, brother. But um, I, I would certainly lean towards trading back. But if there is that player that slips and dives and dips and is sitting there and it's not a big wide range of collection of players, but there's a couple of handful of guys that if they do fall into there, I just can't quite move back. I got to take the elite talent, trust in the evaluation as hard as that would be to wait to the third round. Sometimes you just got to jump in that way and you got to read it kind of in the moment. So it's the part of what will make the first round really fun for our Seahawks is that this is not a set path for th us right now. And that there's so many different ways that they could go. Um, but I, in general, yes, Kevin, just there is a, there is a little like, but if, but if on the other side of it, mm -hmm. um, the snail, what's up, man. Thank you for the $2 donation. He says, is it fair to say that JJ had the most pro style offense? Well, there, I, I did point out when I looked at him, that one thing about him was that he was very comfortable under center. And a lot of these college quarterbacks are not because they never play under center. Penix mm -hmm. is almost never under center. Um, let's see who else. Who else am I thinking of? Who's always in shotgun? Like uh, Nick Caleb. Is, Nix is pretty much almost always in shotgun. Yeah, isn't Caleb almost always in shotgun? Yes, yeah. that's the spread system too. With uh, Ke yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but at the same time, it feels like such a low bar to clear, right? Like these guys learn how to play under center. These guys mm -hmm. learn how to play pro style offenses. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It just strikes me as, you know, searching for things to say that are positive <laughs> about him because he doesn't have the cannon arm, because he doesn't have the over the top mobility or escapability, because he doesn't have those traits. The um, e even you pointed out, like, you know, he's not doing that much processing. Maybe he's doing more than Bo Nix, but he's not yeah. really doing any of that either. So it just feels like you're searching for something to say. Yeah, I, I think that there's some certain reads in the offense of Michigan, which may have had some stylistic stuff with it being back to NFL through Harbaugh kind of related in there where it's a lot of, from what I've read with McCarthy's pre-snap designated stuff. But to Brendan's point, that was about post-snap 
um, going through processes, which is what you don't see. It's not him going back and going, well, what? Da, 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 da. he's not full field reading. It's like they all, a lot of these quarterbacks in college on that where it's, it's one read and then you go to your next thing. It's throw the ball away or go to your check down or it, it's not, you're not seeing him process. Um, and yeah, the, the under center stuff definitely gives you the most part that's going to look most pro style like, because these other quarterbacks just don't do it. So in that realm it is, but to Brennan's bottom line, this and mine too with this nail, it's, it is a, these are small little things. Uh, the footwork can be trained and let's also acknowledge the spread concepts have found their way into the pros. The Seahawks are running the Washington Huskies offense. If Michael Penix walks into the door tomorrow, Michael Penix will not need to have to have any the under center type stuff to learn past them trying to you know include a little bit extra stuff into the offense because of it you know and that stuff is coming more into the league not coming less into the league so I I don't know if the pro style stuff especially with the Michigan offense and how it was being run which Harbaugh went back to he was there for a while with spread concepts and now he went back to that boring. I'm going to hammer you. I mean, is that really the most intricate of offenses, the San Francisco offense prior to Kaepernick with Alex Smith running it, Brendan? Do you remember that? It was like, I mean, yeah. a gap, a gap, a gap, a gap. Oh, we got to throw a third and three, toss into the flat. You know, it's, it isn't exactly like calculus. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's like, it feels like a really low bar that he has to clear to impress people. It's like, I'm sure that Spencer Rattler could have done what JJ McCarthy did. Mm -hmm. I don't know if JJ McCarthy could have done what Spencer mm -hmm. Rattler did. It's a good point. It's a very good point. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if he could have either as well, because Rattler had to process and go through things and may he was forced by baptism by fire to do so, uh, where yeah. JJ was not in that same place. So, uh, yeah, on the surface, you can say it that way, but in the most sort of paper thinish sort of way snail, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. in the, in the most like, just like a, like a little thin layer of film you're pulling off, so to speak of, Pro style. Uh, Nolan in the house. What's up, my man? Nolan, good to see you as always, brother. He says, I am still probably a trade back guy. I believe it was Hawk Blogger that went through John Schneider's first round picks. One through 20, pretty good. 20 plus, pretty bad. Thank you all for the great content. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. I mean, generally, it's probably easier to hit on a pick the higher it is, right? You're picking from a better pool of talent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, to your point on that, Brendan, and now we get to, I remember we talked about this last year. We haven't talked about this part in a while, but let's just take a quick look in, into your point on this. The last, uh, we've had John Schneider picking the top, what, 12, five times? And every single well, one's been a hit? Let me think. Okung, Earl, Earl, was Earl top? No, Earl wasn't top 12, was he? Top 12, yep, top 12. Oh, okay, you're right. Okay. Um, Urban. Cross. Okay, Irvin? I thought Irvin was like 15 or something. Let's call it top 15. Let's go okay. top 15. Okay, Irvin. Yep. Uh, Cross, Spoon. I'm trying all to hit. think. That's it? I think that's it, yeah. No, you're right. That's all. All hits. All hits. Mm -hmm. Not and all hits are created equal, but yes. <laughs> not all hits are created, but no busts. And and that's, to your back to your point again, of it is easier for you to pick at that top point. This is the thing I always go back to and rail on on a yearly basis, and I think sometimes people go... I don't think I, I don't think that that's uh, uh, really the way it is. You know, people will push back on me in this. Well, they'll go, no, there's more than that in the first round. There has to be more than that in the first round. And I always say, you know, it's only really about ten to twelve blue chip guys you get a year, and then once you get past that, and you're getting into thirteen onwards into it, like that sixty five range, they're really all a lot more closer together than they are further apart. And but there's an expectation in general terms of I'm picking at thirteen, I should get player bop, and it just doesn't play that way out really in, in how the talent pool works. In my opinion, I think the other part that's been part that the tough part about them picking bad in the twenties, that's made this even more, it's already an issue on the surface of it. It's already hard to get good players out of that spot. Anyway, in my opinion, two things that's hurt John through that period too, Nolan is number one, he's not just been picking at 20 or 21. He's made high efforts to move back into the deep twenties more often than not. So he's mm -hmm. getting pretty firmly into that tier two range where you're, you're, you're not, you're not dealing with the best, you know, the best of the best in there. So I think that that's another part. And then the second thing I was going to say is that they drafted for need a lot of those years as well as the final hammer to drive that in. And when you're drafting for need and you're trading back in the twenties and the talent pool is a little bit muddled at that point, it's hard to get it right. Yeah. Right. Uh, but just one last point, Brendan, on this one, we'll bounce over back to the corners on this Nolan. 
I still am in favor of trading back this year because it's not that typical of that past where the talent pool dropped off. You might get to 29, 30 and you're into tier tickling tier three. You know, I'm, we're talking about going from, you know, a place at 15, 16, where you're, you're dropping back to a 23, 24, where you're still in that range to get the same player. Plus you pick up that second round pick. It's why this, this draft has to be looked at in a unique way from those other drafts where they move back in that way. Appreciate you, Nolan. Thank, Thank you, man. you, Nolan. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So uh, let's move on here to, did you have another first round grade on this other guy that I'm going to bring up? I, th I think this will be the guy if you do, I don't have a first round or do you have any other first round grades? Uh, I do have one, but I don't think he would be a first. I don't, I don't, I don't want him. I'll put it to you that way. <laughs> okay. You I think, think that somebody out there will want him. Okay. He's going in the first round. You believe? I think so. Yes. All right. Hit me with him. Who you got? I, I do have Nate Wiggins, the Clemson corner. Um, so pretty small, pretty slight of build, which is one of the reasons why I don't think he'd be a very good fit. Uh, almost had the fastest ever 40 time for a corner at the combine. Mm. Really, really fast. He can fly. Somehow had a one five nine ten yard split, which sounds impossible. It's like he ran the first... 10 yards is like a three-legged race and then he got to go for the last 30 or something yeah it was I, I don't i don't know how he did that but he did it kids call um, it island yeah Why? i guess was he doing the gritty for the first 10 yards and then he did a normal run for the last 30 he he thought that the, he thought it was going to make people more excited because they'll be like uh, they'll do that oh and they'll go oh as he's finishing off because he's mm -hmm. like shows he can fly at the end. So it's, mm -hmm. he kind of thought the finish would stick more in people's yeah. mind than the start. Right. So he's got good ball skills, reads routes. Well, his click and close is good. He diagnoses plays. Well, he's got a good amount of versatility, I think to play man and zone, mm -hmm. but um, his movement skills are a little bit like he doesn't, he's not a very fluid mover, even though he's a fast and straight line. He's not interested in playing the run. Like it's not even just he's not a very good tackler. No, he, he's not into it. That's that's for that's for somebody else to do. That's yeah. that's for the other guys. Um his hip flipping looks segmented and he might be too small to be an outside corner. He has the frame to add weight, but then he loses his speed. I don't know if he wants to do that. So I'm a little I I wouldn't want him in McDonald's scheme. I don't think he'd be a fit at all. I do think some team will look at his speed and be like, that's a first round guy. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like uh, with the, uh, what's the name of the Texas receiver who ran the four to one? Uh, Xavier worthy. Yeah. I, I like, I don't think he's a first rounder at all, but I'm not, I would not be surprised if somebody's like, Oh, look at that speed. I got to take this guy in the first round. It might mm -hmm. happen here, but I, I personally would not do it. To your point, we had a draft once where a Hollywood Brown went in the first round, right? And Xavier Worthy probably has a lot of in common with that as a guy as a player. Um, John so Ross your, went in the top 10. John Ross went in the top 10. Uh, yeah, I, I I do see this guy as a second round guy because of the fact that he doesn't tackle. When it comes to the run, it's it's all over the place with the run. I mean, he, his instincts, getting off blocks, the arm length issues for tackling, getting off blocks, it, affect, it affects both it's all worrisome. And then the spirit's not really there either. Um, now as a coverage guy, he's great. I think he is a little bit better in off coverage cornerback and in, in staying kind of off coverage zone coverage post snap. Uh, he's got really great footwork in addition to being fast bread. And he's like got the dancers footwork thing there with the back pedal where it's so smooth and easy and just gets back into it. He can drive on routes. I think he does a lot of stuff pre-snap where he strikes me as a guy that's doing a lot of the, the film study of looking at route concepts and understanding what to anticipate and being a little bit of a step ahead in that, in that way, which um, allows him to just kind of react to things where he's not caught off guard. It feels like post-snap at times. Um, only 18 receptions on 41 targets last year. So did a really good job of just shutting things down to that side when he was targeted, which was not very often. I do come back to the things, though, that you just talked about, which is the two main drivers in this position. Number one, I don't think that the playing in the run is going to improve. It ain't one thing you got to correct. It's like five things you got to you got to correct. Number two, 30 and a half inches. I can't remember a corner in history in the NFL that's taken in the first round with 30 and a half inches. Now, there hasn't been a lot of corners that run 428 
either on the other side of it and show his kind of coverage skills on the outside. He's got that makeup speed. That's what that 428 with the 159 does show you is that if you beat him, he can get back up over the top. And I didn't mm -hmm. see anybody that was able to really stack him on the tape I watched. Nobody that was able to really get over the top because he has that speed that he can come back into and get himself back into the play. But um, good player. Just those two detriments against his game, I think, end up holding him back just enough to keep him kind of more league average and push him into the second round for me. Yeah, I I would be inclined to agree. I certainly wouldn't want him in uh in Seattle with this current no. regime with a coach that clearly wants his defensive backs to tackle. Yeah, that this is the kind of guy who's going like I just I'll roll with Woolen here. We're fine. <laughs> like I I think it can be an okay pro again to 173 pounds. So the short arms comes up and tries to tackle a guy at 173. You get one of these running backs 220 Nick Chubb types. How's this guy going to get down Nick Chubbs to the ground? I mean, you know, yeah. he's not going to be able to wrap around his calf, much much less around his body, you know? Yeah, Kyle Shanahan already already loves running plays towards uh, Woolen. We don't need to give yeah. him another corner that he loves running plays towards. No, no, we do not. Uh, all right, well, this uh, let me get to this. my next one. I think we're going to be in agreement on this one. There's pretty, pretty good, strong clarity at the top, at least I think on these corners for the most part. This is my only other second round corner that I have in this draft, and that's going to be Ennis Rake Straw from Missouri, a 5'11, 183 pound cornerback with just long enough arms, a 4'5, 140 yard dash, 1'5, 10 yard split, 10 broad, 7'5, 3 cone, 4'3, 2 shuttle, all just pretty good times. The three cones, fairly nice. Uh, I put my comp for him, Brendan, as a Marcus Peters type. Mm. Yeah, uh, Ennis uh, Rake Straw, Missouri. Uh, let me see, what did I have here? He's got a nice jab at the line of scrimmage to press receivers. I like mm -hmm. his footwork at the line of scrimmage as well, because sometimes you have to like shuffle to stay in front of the guy to actually lay your your jam on him. Uh, keeps up with the routes pretty well in man, even though he's a little bit on the slower side as far as corners go. Uh, really good ball skills. Finds the ball in the air really well. I know he only had four passes defense last year, but I think his ball skills are really good. His hip flipping is really, really good. He diagnoses plays quickly and accurately. And he's willing to get involved on run support. So there's definitely some good stuff here. Now, I'm a little bit wary of this, given how lackluster his testing was, given how he's undersized. Like, you would expect a 5'11", 183-pound corner to do a little bit better than a 4'5'1". So mm. I don't know if maybe he was just having a bad day or what, but this kind of speed was not what we were ex told to expect from rake straw based on scouting reports. I did notice that like sometimes I'm reading these reports and they're like, Oh, this guy's a phenomenal athlete. We're going to talk about that with the uh, Notre Dame corner in a little bit. And then they test and it's like, um, well, I hope he had a bad day because that is not a phenomenal athlete to me. Um, I wonder if he'll be able to play outside in the NFL because he is only 183 pounds. He has long arms, so he's got a chance, but, I'm a little bit worried about him being too small for the outside. Um, I feel like his technique as a tackler, he does a little bit of ankle diving. I think that doesn't help. Needs to clean that up a little bit. Um, I don't know. I wasn't super into this one. He's good, but I'm more like third round on this guy. I couldn't quite get into second round with him personally. Yeah, I think if you're asking him to come up and play press coverage and do that type of thing, that's not going to be his game. Um, this is the Marcus Peters comp, which Marcus Peters to me made a living off off coverage and then driving on routes and and that type of thing. I don't think Marcus Peter was necessarily the fastest guy either around the same kind of size. It's that they do have the short area quickness. They do have the change of direction, the stop and start, those type of skills to where they can really, really jump on top of routes in a way that's kind of unique. And, you know, you go to a season, even this last year, um, 18 receptions allowed on 28 targets under 200 yards receiving in total on the season. So he wasn't getting beat over the top. He wasn't getting, giving up that on the, on the film that we saw with it. And that's one of those places I come to Brendan, where I say, okay, that the testing scores have got to factor in, but they can't overweigh everything else. And if I'm not seeing him get on tape, if I'm, I'm seeing him be quick on tape, if, if I'm seeing him not having that be something that necessarily holds him back, then that gives me confidence to believe that it'll carry forward going, you know, into the pro level where just some guys aren't testers, you know, some guys aren't, that's just not their game. Uh, I liked him, I think a little bit more than you did too, as a, as a tackler. I thought he was really willing to get back, get after it. Another place where he reminded me a little bit of Marcus Peters is he had some of that chippiness that Marcus would have uh, off the, you know, what he did, you know, kind of brings a little bit of that spirit with him um, on, on that side of things. 
Um, don't think he'll be a sensational guy. He does have 100 snaps out of the slot this last year, like you talked about. So there's some versatility potentially in what he could bring you on inside, outside. <clears throat> I think the main issue for me was just that he's stacked up some penalties over the past couple of years. He will get a little bit grabby, and um, I, you know, I didn't clean it up, but that's that's where – uh, the main issue came from with me was just he's going to have to do a little bit less of that. But uh, I thought he's overall going to give you a pretty solid floor. He may not have that that high top side. He's in that kind of Terry and Arnold angle of it for me where it's like, well, you're not getting the high top end. You're going to get this solid floor here of what he provides you. And he's got to go to the right scheme. But if he does, I think he'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I couldn't quite get warmed up on him. There are a couple of corners that I liked more than him personally. Understandable. Totally, uh, totally understandable with uh, Rake Straw. Uh, concierge with Nolan. Thank you for another man. $20 donation. Very kind of you, Nolan. Very, very kind of you, brother. He says, uh, 2011, Carpenter, 25th. 2016, Fetty 31st. 2008, Rashad Penny, 27th. 2019, LJ Collier. 2020, Brooks hit. At 27th, just hope he doesn't try reaching depending on the gap between picks. Trading back will be clo will close that gap. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I don't know. Like, Excuse me. I don't know if we can call Penny like a – it ended up being a bad pick. I don't know if it was a dumb pick, right? Like, like you look at some of these others, it's like if Fetty was a dumb pick, we were reaching to get a offensive lineman. Exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. And I think – we were getting somebody who was clearly like a third or fourth round talent in the first round because we were like, well, this is what we need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, well, I, I think the need part you just mentioned, look mm -hmm. back at these picks, Brennan. Let's go through it. Carpenter 25th. You needed offensive line. You were rebuilding the offensive line. You're hoping he could slide into tackle. If he didn't, you had so much room on the offensive line. You could kick him into guard. Mm -hmm. That's, but you it, remember on draft day with that Nick Saban sitting there with um, the, the running back uh, from Alabama. Oh, in the Ingram, right? Ingram. Yeah. He's with yeah. Ingram. And then like, and it's such a bad look for Saban at the time. Like, hold your poker face, bud, because Carpenter gets announced. Ingram hasn't been picked yet. Saban starts like, it's like that's your player, dude. That's your lineman. You should like clapping. You now clap. But it spoke to a little bit of Saban's. You could see Saban's opinion. This just speaks to a bit of the reach aspect. If Fetty, like you said, we needed a right tackle. We walked into that draft needing a starting right tackle. You take a Fetty with Petty. You worried about Carson's injury history and you needed to have some insurance for Carson. So it again was still driven as a pick for need. I don't mind Penny. I'm not knocking Penny like, okay, the value's there doing it, but was the pick drawn by the value of Penny or was it drawn to make sure you could hedge your bet with Chris Carson? And then LJ Collier, I mean, come on. That was the biggest need of any of these, Brendan. Maybe that was even bigger maybe than a Fetty where you're hoping this guy was going to come in day one and give you pass rush. And as I had said too on that previous thing with that Nolan, as you see with it, all these picks, 25 and back. 25, 31, 27, 29. None of these are up at 22 or 23. Where the only way if I'm advocating, if we go back to 25, it's because we picked up such a great pick on the other side to flip up. It's like you're not just moving back for a little kicker pick. You're getting something substantial to move back that far, which we weren't getting back on any of our trade backs in those drafts, by the way. If I'm not mistaken, Brendan, the most we got back on any of those trades was like a a, a late third on, on any of those ones that we moved back on. Yeah, some of the trade backs were good. The Collier trade back was the really bad one. Was that was the point where it became clear that everybody knew the Seahawks wanted to trade down so badly that they didn't have to offer us a lot to get us to go with it. Yeah. Like that was the point where it became clear that okay, we've gone back to this well a few too many times. Trading for the sake of trading versus actually truly getting value. Right. So, um I will say I don't think Brooks was for need because you still had Wagner and Wright at the time. I think they genuinely just thought Brooks was that good, and I, I don't think they were right. I think they were incorrect in that assessment, but I don't think that was just like a need. You don't think they had? You don't think they went? They said we're going to be walking into the season with two early thirties lineback, two two of our starting linebackers mm -hmm. in the early thirties, mm -hmm. and that we're going to have a high likelihood that one of those two guys, if not both, is going to be injured. I mean. The thing Brooks didn't even play that much that rookie year because most of the time you only have two linebackers on the field and because KJ stayed healthy. Yeah, That's yeah, they stayed team. healthy, but I don't view that as need. Like we had needs that offseason. I remember looking at the roster that offseason thinking, you know, we have clear needs that are much bigger than linebacker, and yet they decided to go with a linebacker. So I think that was more about them just thinking Brooks was better than he was. Could have been. I don't know for sure on that one. So I it's th that's the thing I do wonder with that one is they were they were thinking 
playing the, I think they, I felt like they're playing a little bit of the likelihood scenario. It's likely week six, we lose KJ Wright. It's likely Bobby Wagner goes down week, week 10 at his age with how many games these guys have played. And they just happened to get through that year. Both of them were able to keep it going, but I don't know if they were counting on that being what they thought would be the likelihood. It'd be interesting to see what John thought with that. Cause you would admit if that was the drive, then it does show to the poorness of moving for need there. If that was the puller, right? That was the lever then wrong lever to pull. Right. Nolan, though, uh, thank you for the donation. And uh, I echo your sentiments on this. You don't want to go back too far unless you're going back so far, you're picking up so many extra picks. But Brendan talked about this. It's it, it, We traded back for the sake of trading back. We can't trade back for the sake of trading back. It's got to be because you're getting the value back. And if the trade partner is there, isn't there, then he isn't there. That's John can, and he's run into this. We've, we've gotten to look behind the curtains the last couple of years with John. There's been some moments where they've actively heard on certain picks where they're, they're trying to burn up the phone lines and make a trade back. And there's just not the team offering that, you know, they can, I think there's a little bit of the word around with John at times that you can go low ball him a little bit because if he's so eager to move back and John has to be probably re-digging in his toes a little bit on this one to make sure that that doesn't happen as he goes forward and has in probably recent recent drafts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <coughs> Excuse me, Brandon. Sorry. Not a problem. Uh, no, Nolan, very kind of you, though, on the, uh, yes, on the donation, bro. Very, very kind of you. All right. Uh, so that was the end of my second rounders. Let's, let's start tossing through some of your second rounders here. Yeah, I had a pretty decent amount. I had uh, TJ Tampa in my second round. Okay. Did He's you look at TJ Tampa? He is the next guy up on my on my board, but I put him in the third round. So we both like him as the next okay. corner up, just a little lower on him. I liked him more than Rakestraw, personally. Um, I think he's going to be really good in zone. Um, click and close is really good. He's got the length to get involved in a lot of passes that most human beings would not be able to because he's got those long arms he can stick in there. Uh, he keeps up pretty well on vertical routes with his speed. He reads routes and processes them correctly, not afraid to tackle. He's physical in coverage, but not to an extent where I feel like it's going to get a ton of flags in the NFL. I think he uses physicality correctly. Um, he doesn't have reactive athleticism, which hurts him when he tries to play in man. And his transitions from his back pedal to turning his back are kind of slow. I feel like if you don't put him in man coverage, you'll be okay. So I think that TJ Tampa, as long as you put him in a zone heavy scheme, which is what we have, is going to be pretty great. So I put him in my second round. Yeah, I, I do like him a lot. And I think he's a lock solid cornerback, Brendan, that has really few, if any, real major flaws to his game. The things I think I would pick at him are more just this and that, you know, um, he can actually lay some licks too. He's got a bit of, of, of an ability to hit you. Um, from the corner position that's kind of unique versus the others that you see. Um, <clears throat> I think that there is a little bit of a, the lack of speed thing with him that I do feel. Um, I felt like he was a, it, with a lot of the off cover stuff that's similar to the the guy we just talked about, uh, Rakestraw, but with him, it was just all cover three. And so there were so many snaps with him just dropping to the bail technique, staying over top, and then the receiver having the, op the opportunity to then hit the stop route, hit the, the in route. Now, that's not his fault, but it just made it harder to necessarily put him in that evaluated state as Rakestraw, where there was more of him driving on routes and staying on top. More of the both of those things going on rather than just, you know, kind of the one that I was getting with with TJ. But he was being asked to do it with a coverage responsibility. So I don't know if he I don't know if he's doing man match. You know, I don't know if he's allowed to come back underneath on that. You know, and sometimes you don't have that responsibility to do it. Um, don't think he's got much in the way of ball skills. More often than not, I didn't see him getting his head turned around. I thought that the slow developing routes caused him to get in a position to panic and and get that old you know hook out there to hook the receivers up because he's not trusting his speed especially and that he could have a little bit of propensity to run into that at times on the tape um <clears throat> tackled uh well enough solid i i didn't think it was necessarily overwhelming but just just fine um but i just thought it was a little bit the, there's still the same lack of speed we talked about with rake straw but just a couple of little extra things with his game that i didn't quite like that he's got to, I think, uh, kind of commit. But he's a natural receiver. He's got a natural feel out there for how to play the position. Um, he's not going to usually give up the big play, even if he does get beat. He's going to get that penalty, but that's 15-yard penalty in college. So it's like 10-yard penalty, five-yard penalty. It's like whatever. Um, so smart player also. Good awareness, really smart, good understanding of how to play the position. I like him, Brennan. I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just feel like he'd be a good fit for what we do here. I understand that. And I, I can see uh, potentially him being a, a Hawk target. He's got the size. He certainly can tackle well enough, good arm length. You don't have to question those things on him. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we'll keep it in moving here. And I did have him at the top of my third round. Did you have any other second round corners? Uh, I actually had, I think, two more. Okay. Uh, first guy, this is kind of one of my crushes, uh, Mike oh. St. Ristol. Oh, Mike okay. St. Ristol of Michigan. Knows. The CEO. Right. So this guy is probably going to be a slot in the NFL because he is a little bit undersized. Uh, probably going to be one of those nickel corners. But this is the guy that, well, a couple interesting things about him. So first of all, he was one of the guys for that Michigan defense who was considered a leader. He was the guy who would be calling out route combos and plays from the uh, offenses they would play. And he was really good at it. Like even in the national title game against one of the best offenses in the country, he was calling stuff out and really frustrating that Washington offense. And uh, the receivers on Washington have talked about how he, he was calling out their plays um, mm. pre-snap. So you're bringing that to the table. He moved to cornerback from wide receiver two years ago. He has only been playing cornerback for two years. So even though he's 23, I feel like he's going to get exponentially better. I think that's one of the things that I look for with these guys who just made the position move. Um, 40 inch vert, 10 foot, 11 inch broad. So he's very explosive. He's not the fastest, but he's very explosive. Um, high IQ. He's a weapon blitzing off the edge as well. He's one of the best blitzing corners in this class. Very good ball skills. Had six interceptions last year. Um, now, he's not reactive enough to hang in man coverage reliably. And bigger receivers are going to have their way with him because he's 5'9", 182. But I like this guy more than most, I think, because of that cerebral element and that growth that he can have over the next couple of years because he just started playing corner. Yeah, uh, Brendan, I do I do like him a lot. I, I put him into my third round range of it. So again, we're not far off in our, our, our assessment of it. The thing you mentioned about that two years too, is that what's interesting there is it's two years of solid back-to-back -back production, including great production this past year. So it's not two years of a guy changing positions and like struggling to find himself, but he's been able to hit the ground running in many ways right from the jump. They had a uh, cornerback uh, pre-draft thing that we were making reference to this where all these cornerbacks got together to train together and within like 24 hours, the players were calling him the CEO. He is a real potential leader on your defense and a guy that can help in that capacity for what it brings on top of being a baller and a playmaker that is very rare to get from the slot. It's not easy to be a high pick guy from that area of things. You just don't get the opportunity. It's too easy for slot receivers to create really easy, fast separation. And so him doing that, it's legitimate. And you see it on some of those picks where he is truly jumping the route like a former receiver that he is. So this guy's got some sensational upside to his game. I think he also mitigates his problems, Brendan. The issues of being undersized and short, where he does a great job of getting himself really draped into the receiver on the routes and make sure he's always close so that when the ball arrives, he's there to be in a position to do something about it. And then he can use things like his 40 inch vertical leap where he might have a, a receiver taller than him, but with that explosive leaping ability, find a way to get up there and impact the play. So he, he does a good job to fit around those little bit of detriments, even though you get away with being this size in the slot, Brendan, but I love his upside. True, true, really nice upside here to be a guy that could be a top five slot in this league and uh, understandable why you might put that guy into that second round range because of it. Yeah, uh, slot receivers becoming more and more important as the uh, years go by. We just drafted one in the first round last year, so it's uh, it's definitely starting to gain some traction on that side of things. Uh, all right, let's keep it uh, moving on down here. And uh, do you, who's your last guy in the second round? Uh, I also had. I probably like this guy more than most. Max Melton. <clears throat> I'm definitely intrigued by not necessarily personally because I think he'll be a little bit better as a man corner. Mm -hmm. But I do think that Max Melton will make somebody very happy somewhere, maybe not here. So Rutgers, yes, he is related to Bo Melton. They're brothers, I believe. They are in the same family. For anybody who's wondering, he's got length. He's got 32 and an eighth inch arms, which in this class is actually good. I know some years you've got these corners that have like, you know, 40 inch arms. Not so much this year, like you were no. saying. Yeah. But he had a great combine. He's a great athlete, very explosive. Um, good ball production the last two years, 16 passes, defense, five interceptions, really good in run support. He has the reactive athletic abilities to perform well in man, also has the field awareness to do zone. He's pretty good at pressing at the line of scrimmage. Um, high motor, should be able to play inside and outside. 
I think sometimes he goes a little overboard with the aggression. He can get a little over the top with his physicality. Like sometimes he'll be trying to press so hard he just ends up getting completely toasted mm-hmm. at the line mm-hmm. if he misses. Uh, his hip transitions are a little bit awkward. His ball skills do occasionally fade in and out. So I like him a lot. I think he's a second rounder to somebody, not necessarily here, because I think he'll be really good in man, but I I like him a lot. Yeah, he just kind of moves in general, doesn't he, Brennan, like you want an outside corner to move. Um, you know, feels like a really great athlete for the position right off the gate. Easy backpedal. He's got some twi- the twitchiness to his testing times is what you see from him on the field. Um, he's willing to be violent and come up and, and take a shot as far as that goes, which, which stood out to me. I did feel like his tackling was otherwise shaky. He had a 27% missed tackle rate, um, on the year, which is, I think about really? the high, uh, it was, it was about the highest I saw from any of the cornerbacks in this class. Huh. So I did not see that I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah. A little bit, a bit of a guy that a little bit as well with, you know, only gave up the 24 receptions, 252 yards did give up four touchdowns. Um, I do think he's best being in zone and being allowed to kind of freelance and read the quarterback's eyes and work off of that a little bit because there are times where he can show some upside to being able to jump routes and and be kind of, I don't want to say a pick machine, but when he can really lock in and trust that stuff with his potential explosiveness and twitch, there is that kind of tantalizing upside there to him. I just felt like there was a little bit more rough road there with him to go through Brendan to get to that stage of things and it knocked him and dinged him down for me just a little bit because of it. Yeah, okay, I can understand that. There's some rawness there for sure, but I think the talent is very appealing. Can't deny the talent. Uh, the the 40, 41 inch vert, eleven four broad. I mean, it's and on that's on a four three nine, and he's not super tiny on the arm, so he's got enough arm length on the outside. It's fine. Um, just felt like there were some rough roads you had to clear away, clear some brush away, clear a little debris, maybe cut a cut a log off the middle of the road, and then he'll be fine. But I think that's going to take him a while to get there. Mm-hmm. Who is your uh, number? Well, let me go to, I guess, let me see if it's my next guy in the third round. I've got Kamari Lassiter out of Georgia was my second guy. Yeah, um, he is a third round guy for me. I did have a couple guys I liked a little bit more, but I do put Lassiter in the third. Georgia, um, pretty decent size, had a really good three cone, 662. So good change of direction skills. No picks over the last two years. 12 passes defensed. Uh, Versatile uh, enough to play outside and inside in the NFL. Uh, Has proven himself in man and zone. So he's flexible, right? He can play a lot of different roles potentially in the NFL. He moves really smoothly. He's not afraid to get physical and make tackles. Uh, I like his change of direction and his football IQ is good. I do wonder if he's a little bit lean to be an outside corner successfully. He also has shorter arms, sub 31. Mm -hmm. Um, doesn't have upper level speed to keep up with the speeds to receivers. I feel like his eyes get stuck in the backfield sometimes. Like he starts watching what's going on in the backfield and then he gets beat over the top. Um, mediocre ball production as well. So a lot of question marks for me. I couldn't quite circle the wagons here. The aggregate has him as a high second round pick. I put him in the third. Yeah, I definitely liked him a little bit more, Brennan. Um, one of the best last year for the production as far as targets to catch is only 15 catches for 136 yards given up last year. That was down from 400 given up uh, the previous year. So he really took some steps forward, I thought, this year in uh, in improving in that realm of things, um, which when I see that improvement, it just gets me more encouraged, especially a guy playing the SEC where there's no real place to go out there and hide. Um, not much ball skills, and he can get grabby. Um, the, the speed thing is true here with him, Brennan at four or five where it's, you know, sometimes he gets worried about that whole, maybe I can't stay with this guy thing. I think he's a great, a really strong run defender in, in addition to being a really good cover man. I think just, this is a tough, hard nosed cornerback. He's got versatility to play their manner zone, um, smooth back pedal, um, probably at his best in press, but I think he can give you that off coverage stuff too, as well. So I, I think for this guy, I raised him maybe a little bit more than you, because I saw just a bit more of that ability to fit to the versatility to what the Seahawks would want. Really liked how he tackled, really liked how he improved his final year in college. The short arms are valid. 30, almost 31 inch arms are, are definitely a little bit of a problem, but it didn't seem to hold them back at the college level and, uh, outstanding production last year, not necessarily from a pick standpoint, but just in, you know, what he did on the field all in every other realm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. 
Uh, Kevin Mullen, thank you for another $10 donation. Kevin, you are awesome, brother. I really do appreciate you. You know and killing it tonight. He says, uh, if we draft Penix, wouldn't it make sense to draft for a right tackle to protect his blind side, assuming Lucas is not ready? With this deep O-line draft, shouldn't Rosengarten be in play? F the Niners. Yes, indeed. F the Niners. We probably should get that in every show at least once, Kevin. That would be probably proper. <laughs> But um, if we draft Penix, would it make sense to draft a right tackle to protect his blind side if Lucas isn't ready, Brendan? So, okay, let's go through this. Kevin, we're going to run through this here. We got Seahawks pick at 16, Penix falls. They pick, they pick Penix at 16. They come back around to the third round, Is and Rosengarten is there. Is that, in essence, very likely to be the the pick that you lean to making at that point, even going beyond the, the value-based model that we talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're leaning a little more to need at that point because you have a, a guy in Grubb who goes, I know what I got in this guy. This will be good. Da, 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 da. You know, he's played with this quarterback. Is that the next corresponding pick to make on that? Uh, the problem is you don't know what you currently have. It. You might have a really good right tackle. You don't know. And you already signed your depth right tackle, and he's a pretty good one, and one that you've invested a pretty good amount of money into. This is, I mean, this is the frustrating thing about this offseason as it regards to the right tackle spot. We don't know where we're at. We're well, let's run, let's run this though. Lucas is not going to be ready to the start of the season. You you do have yeah. fan. So that's the key part of his question, I think, is that Lucas is not ready. Well, then if that's the case then I think, yeah, you probably do because you're thinking about long-term because if you draft Penix, you're planning on him being your quarterback for the next 15 years. So you need to give him a right tackle that's going to be there for a good chunk of that time. And at that point, I think you have to start saying Lucas just isn't going to make it past his rookie deal because he can't stay healthy. Yeah, there's there does have to come a point here, Kevin, where we got to call the ball on Lucas and not counting on him. It doesn't mean we have to throw him away. It just means that we have to start to to build in a little bit more. And while I like George Fant is an insurance policy, I don't know if it's the best item for the long term at that point. And then and, and getting Penix, the big thing that I've always harped on is if you're gonna get Penix, the next corresponding thing you need to drift towards is making sure your offensive line is on point and ready to go. So there'd be a heavy draw for me to go that route with it too, Kevin. If not right tackle, then of course left guard. Something to the offensive line would be the next move to go and make. Um, so one way or another, that's what you got to do on the other end of it with Penix to me. But um, Rosengarten would certainly be very interesting. He did a good job for Penix out at uh, UW in, in that role, essentially as the blindside protector there for the lefty. Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, that's another reason why, I mean, like, the whole lefty thing in the NFL with quarterbacks, like some people, uh, there is a legitimate reason why teams shy away from them. It, it just reverses everything. I think some people have the, get the sense that it's just like some weird random quirk that everybody has where they don't like left-handed quarterbacks. No, it actually makes you do everything backwards. And some teams are co very comfortable with their right-handed quarterbacks. Yeah. And Brendan's right. It's got to, you got to flip, you have to flip everybody around on what they're doing a bit. And that can be a little bit like playing opposite handed sometimes for the rest of the, the unit. Um, on top of the fact, the ball spins different out of their hand. You got to get used to that, you know, cause it's coming opposite and receivers are used to it spinning the other way. But um, yeah, well thought out there, Kevin. I think that's definitely the next move you're making. If you're making that one, otherwise you're going to lead, you're going to lead Penix down the road of potential ruin there. If you don't address it in a strong major way at that point. I'm not so sure Rosengarten is going to be there. And I will say this last point on this, Kevin, is just that uh, the tackles to me in this draft and the guards in this draft are not quite as strong as at first blush. And that we could get ourselves into that third round range, late third round, and there is nobody there worthy to be picked mm -hmm. um, at that point, especially versus other positions, which will have much higher value by that point. So that's maybe something to consider along those lines here too. So mm -hmm. you'd have to yeah. do it. Yeah, just keep trading down until you have every pick in the bottom half of the fifth round. Just slowly. <laughs> it's like the the paper clip. You know, you trade the paper clip for something and eventually you work your way up to a house. That's what we we're go. gonna do. That's right. <laughs> John John working his mastery, Brendan. Mm -hmm. His magicianship. Um, all right. Well, let's keep uh keep moving. We got a ton of corners here to get through. And uh thank you guys for so much on your uh support on the channel, Kevin. Very, very kind of you, brother. Um, thank you, Kevin. Next guy I've got up here on my list is the uh, the big the big dog the big kid out of Oregon, 
Uh, Kyrie Jackson, six foot three, hundred ninety five pound corner, almost thirty three inch long arms, ran a four five forty one five ten yard split. Brennan at six three one ninety five. That's a great ten yard split. Yeah, Pete would have liked this guy. Pete would have really been into this one. He would have been. Um, my comp for him is Brandon Browner, but not quite as mean or angry, nor the ball skills. Is mm -hmm. that, uh, does that track for you? That, that I mean, that's pretty good. Only one year of big production last year for Oregon. I think he was a transfer from, I want to say, Alabama, and he didn't do anything there. That's right. Right. So he's big, physical, very disruptive at the point of catch, really good reading the play and watching it develop in zone, just hanging back in zone. Let him face the line of scrimmage. He's going to do good stuff. Plays the ball well. Gives effort when tackling. Some of the issues he has is change of direction is kind of slow, awkward. Only one year of production, so we don't have a big sample size to go on here. We'll probably get flagged for physical play in the NFL. Probably can't hang with quicker receivers in man, and he doesn't have the strength you would prefer. Now, he is 6'4", or 6'3", on your list. On my list, he's 6'4". I don't know what's true or not, but either way... He can add What's reality. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. might be six more. I might have that as an older one there. So. Yeah. He, um, he could add weight if he needs to. So under Pete Carroll, this would have been a perfect corner to get. And Mike McDonald might like him too. So Kyrie Jackson, um, I'd say third rounder, maybe even early third. I like this guy. He's an early third for me too, Brendan. I did like him a lot as well. And I, I think your points about both being a Pete and McDonald kind of cat, that very well could be the case here. I thought he showed some versatility but and kind of rarely so for being a six foot three, six, six foot four guy that actually plays some man coverage situations. Most of the time, you're just keeping those guys in zone off coverage. We're going to talk about one guy potentially out of Arizona State that's this way where you're just trying to keep them in a position of having them extra time to flip their hips and roll to get to the to get to the go routes and still being able to jump stuff underneath if they have the time to jump stuff underneath if they see it. He showed a little bit of man coverage ability there at Oregon, though zone was you know mainly I think what he was playing. Um, speed's not there. What you know you're not going to get is pretty straightforward. Not, you're not going to get. Not a lot of top end speed. Brendan talked about the flipping the hips. This is the problem you get with a six three six foot corner that there's really no way to get around it. There's some upside to what they give you, like specifically the length and ability to get to balls in short spaces that other smaller corners can't get to. But the flipping the hips is always going to be a bit of a problematic spot for those guys that are just bigger corners. He doesn't have really anything as far as ball skills go to me as well. Um, I, I thought that's he's got. I think what he had uh, two picks this last year. One was an overthrow and one was a tip. So he's he's not doing anything on that side of it. I thought he was relentless though as a run defender, which is what would be I think very appealing to both Carroll and and uh, uh, McDonald. Being this is a bigger guy that plays like a bigger guy on the outside, and right. that's that's also a nice part of his game. Yeah, it was three interceptions actually. Was it three? My bad. Yeah, I had three. I robbed him. I robbed him of one. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm a fan. Good player. Uh, next, we got on the list here is a kid for me out of TCU in my third round. As I go down, this is a guy right around the third round for me. Uh, Josh Newton out of TCU. TCU always seems to kick out one corner a year from their program minimum to the pros. Uh, 5'11, 190, a little bit short arms, 31 and 1 8 inch, 4'5, 140, 1 5, 5, 10 yard split. Uh, okay, testing numbers all the way along the line. Nothing eye popping in them, Brennan. What were your uh, thoughts on uh, Josh Newton? Did you also see him as third rounder? I got him a little high for you. I had him in my late third round, yes. Okay. Um, really flexible across schemes and positions. I think he can play man. I think he can play zone. I think he can play inside. I think he can play outside. He's got lateral agility and quickness to hit press at the line as well. Although, with his arms being kind of short, I don't know if he'll be able to press in the NFL. He's very explosive on his click and close. He reads routes and handles them really well when he's in zone. And I think his flexibility will work in the NFL for the most part. I think that he will be able to continue to be somebody who can play zone and man pretty well. His ball skills are pretty good. He's got 21 passes defensed over the last two years. <clears throat> now, he is a little bit slower. He is going to struggle a little bit on nine routes. He's not going to keep up as well as you would like. He doesn't flip his hips all that well. And he's, you know, a little bit short-armed. So I think his mediocre testing got people to sleep on him a little bit. And I understand that. I think there's just a lot Newton brings to the table that's good, regardless of him being a mediocre athlete. So I would say late first. Yeah. 
I felt like he ran on the field like a four four guy, even though he tested like a four five guy. Yeah, that I said late first. That's a pretty big difference from what I actually have. Late third, my bad. <laughs> oh no, no, you're good. I know what you meant. Um, but do you is are you buying that what I'm selling on that? I felt like he's four four in the field and four. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could I could go for that, I guess. I'm trying to remember. I watched so much cornerback tape. I know. Year. They out four thirty six guys blend together, man. What are you gonna do? <laughs> So it's, it does happen. Um, yeah, I, I like him a lot. I think he's just a solid all around cornerback prospect. Um, maybe not a ton of sizzle here with this guy, but I think that he's pretty pro ready to come in and help your program out. Even if it's just to kind of come in as a rotational corner, start a couple games over the course of the season. Uh, he can do both the off coverage and press stuff. So you give a little bit of the versatility with him. I didn't see him hardly ever tested in the games. I watched Brandon, nobody was really willing to go his way. He allowed less than 50% of the balls thrown his way to be completed, uh, which stands out. A lot of these guys are well over 50%, even guys that don't give up a lot of catches. So very rarely tested. When he was, you had a hard time catch, you know, completing the ball on him. Another guy with no ball skills really to speak of on the outside, so he's not giving you any kind of upside on that. I thought he played the run well enough for me, strong enough. It was about, you know, be about an average rate for a prospect coming out, which is, you know, neither plus nor minus on him. So I just thought he could be a guy that with his skill set, Brennan might round out into being a league average corner. And when I look at the third round, that's kind of my basis there is, can this guy round out to being a league average corner with his upside? Is there a likelihood he's going to hit that upside? And if the answer Mm -hmm. is yes and yes, I'll kind of put him into that, into that range. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Another guy here in my mini third rounders, Brennan, I got a lot of them. Uh, mm-hmm. Is a kid out of uh, Florida State, Renardo Green. Uh, yes, I definitely looked at him as well. And I generally agree with your sentiment. I had him in my third round as well. Real real good corner here. Real fun corner here. Another short arm guy. This is that thing I was telling you too where you said you're coming from those, those long arms. It's like you're looking at all these 31s. You're going, damn. Yeah. But, but he's got the speed, right? He's got the quickness. He's got the explosiveness. Yeah, he's flexible across man and zone. He played both at Florida State. Outside or slot, press or off, he can do it all. He is super flexible. That alone gives you value. Mm -hmm. You can put him in any scheme, in any position, and I think he'll find a way. He's good at reading and diagnosing plays. He's got good click and close, good tackler, good blitzer, explosive all-around athlete, had a really big broad jump. Now, I think he will draw some flags in the NFL the way he's currently playing. Mm -hmm. Only one interception the last two years is notable. He did have 13 passes defense last year, though, so he does have ball skills. And he's a little too overly energetic with his press at times, I think. But that can be fixed, right? Like, that's all fixable. A good coach gets in there and takes care of it. So really well-rounded. I think he has a chance to do a little bit of everything. So give me him in the third round all day. Yeah, he's uh he's a good play, another fun player in the third round for me. Um, it just I I to your point in the grabbing, Brendan and I wrote down, you know, he grabs like a toddler trying to stay attached to his mother on the move, you know, and it just I mean, he's just he is definitely that part's there. And the aggressive part you talked about, you know, double moves, long developing routes. You can get him with this stuff because he wants to be so aggressive. But as you also said, and I agree that it's you, you want to you, you like the aggressiveness. You can tell them to back up a little bit on that. You can tell them to dial it back at times. Sometimes it's hard on on to get guys to go and, and get them to be in that that mentality and mindset. So I just loved his aggressiveness and coverage. I think it's going to overall work. He is better in man than zone. So you want to put him in man with that aggressiveness. You got to clean up the the grabbiness. That's for sure. I really thought he was a gnarly tackler, Brennan. He will twist you in half. He will cut you down to the ground. I saw him over and over again playing really well against the run. And uh, it stood out to me in this class uh, on that side of it. So there's some things to clean up in his game. I, very good patience at the line of scrimmage. Doesn't open the door to his hips too early. Knows he can trust his quicks and his speed. That stuff was legit to me on the football field. Um, you know, when you've got that confidence to know you can run with anybody, it just lets you be kind of aggressive like that. And I also thought he has some good late hands. Not a lot of picks, but shows some upside in his ability to get interceptions at the next level because he can turn back, look, find the ball, get the hands up late, and make a pick. Uh, he's got a bit of that that ability to him. Next up in the uh, third round for me, another one here, Brendan, out of Ole Miss. And this is going to be DeAndre DeAndre Prince, a six foot three, 183 pound quarterback. Hey, have you guys heard this yet before so far on the show? He's got some short arms, 30 and three fourths inch arms, but he ran a blazing four, three, eight, and an even more blazing one, four, seven, 10 yard split. Brendan, 
Where you at on DeAndre Prince? Well, I couldn't really circle the wagons around this one all that much. The speed's <laughs> great. The acceleration's incredible. I like the way he plays the run. He's not mm. afraid. Although I do think he's overly aggressive. I do think he puts himself out of position a lot. Uh, he's good in zone. He just kind of waits for the play to develop and then makes his read based on what he sees. He's aggressive at swiping at the receiver's hands to dislodge the ball. His speed and acceleration are unimpeachable. But his press is inconsistent. He gives up a lot of cushion. And it feels like his instincts haven't really developed yet. I, I don't get the sense that he's a very comfortable player doing cornerback stuff. So I was a little bit more, I think, in the fifth round with this guy. I, I just wasn't convinced that he was ever going to grow past this stage where he's a raw prospect because he's been starting for years with Mississippi. Three-year starter. Yeah. So I don't know. I couldn't really get into this one. The speed's appealing, but I couldn't really get past like the fifth round with him. Yeah, I definitely liked him a little bit more. He is a wispy cornerback at 183 and six feet tall. Um, but the three-year starter, he's played in a variety of different looks, pre-snap coverage looks all across the board just throughout the game. Um, and he shows fluidity to me within all of them. Um, very adept at staying on top of routes, only targeted about three times a game last year, which is not much at all. Um, yeah, he's on the smallish side. Um, he's not going to be a ferocious tackler, but he'll do what he's got to do in that area of his game. I thought his ball skills, well, they're not they're not zero, but they're definitely below average. I do think that he does a great job of utilizing that speed and quickness to make him a better football player. You know, he's coming up on, a, let's say, you know, a screen play and the lineman's trying to get up there to lay the blocks and his speed will speed him around that block to the ball carrier where other players might get hung up because they're not that quick. And to me, he did that over and over at times on tape when coming up and helping up as a tackler where he's utilizing that speed in a way where it's getting on top of ball carriers before they can be prepared for it to arrive because he's just so sudden. It's There were times I watch him, it just felt like you're watching a blur on the football field that was very unique for him. Maybe it's as much that one, four, seven, ten 10 yard split where it's just, he can cover a short space of ground there so quickly um, that just stood out to me. And I thought again, overall fairly complete, uh, just like that particular little aspect of his game. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, moving right along here through my third round, I had the Melton was also the other guy in my third round. And then this guy who is a guy that didn't test um, through this process. I think he was dealing with a, a bit of an injury, if I'm not mistaken. The kid out of Tennessee, a guy that I liked really early on in the process, Kamal Haddon, six foot one, 196 corner, another short arm, 30 and seven eighths inch cornerback here. I definitely had him. Let me take it. Yeah, yeah, I did have him. Uh, yeah, this is another one. It looks like I wasn't too excited by it. Let me take a look at what I wrote down here. Yeah, short arms, but he does have a longer frame. Missed a lot of 2023. He's got mm. the size to play outside. He's good in press man, although he probably won't be able to press in the NFL because his arms are too short. Mm. Uh, showed the ability to stick with his man throughout a route. So good in man coverage. Not afraid to track deep balls. And he's stronger than the typical corner is what I wrote. But he doesn't have the speed. I, I'm a little worried about the speed maybe crippling his ability to play man coverage in the NFL. Um, not a good tackler. Will probably attract flags because he's grabby. And the injury he suffered is non-trivial. So to me, I kind of look at him. And with so many corners in this draft, why am I going to take one that's still getting over a pretty serious injury when I can go get so many of the others? So I ended up putting him down in like the fifth round as well, actually. Yeah, it's it's certainly going to make you dodgy when you don't have the testing numbers to fall back on with him here, and 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 we just don't. Um, I like the speed and the quickness a little more than you did on the tape, as far as thinking it was going to hold up. Um, and I did think though that the season was cut short. He had just seven games played this year. He had three interceptions in those seven games. He only gave up twelve receptions on ninety six yards in those seven games. So the the tape that was out there, he was really good on. Um, there is a little bit of an issue with the penalties and getting grabby, um, which could be an indi indicator of the fact maybe not the speed stuff isn't there as much. I thought he had a little bit of a peanut Tillman punch at times where I think he offers maybe some upside and be able to do that at the pro level where he's, he seems pretty fluid with it. Just like just flip hip, the way he could flip his hips, the way he could stop and start and change direction with routes. It just kept him in the back hip pocket. A lot of times in, in watching the game tape I saw from him. And again, I think I trusted a little bit more of the quickness and speed to go along with that athleticism that he brings to feel like this is going to hold up at the pro level. The shoulder injury has got to check out with the meds, Brendan, no doubt about that. 
Um, and you've got to make sure that that's not, that's not going to be a long-term issue. But uh, I did like the tape overall and what I saw from him and a, and a pretty good run defender as well. He gets after it in that part of his game. Okay. I, I wasn't too high on the tackling personally, but um, I was going off tape. I, I didn't, I, I usually don't check like the missed tackle rate with a lot of these guys, which maybe I should start doing because sometimes, you know, what you see in a limited sample size can throw you off the bigger picture. That's kind of why I lean to it a little bit at times with it, just to, to make a, to check on that. And, um, it's, it'll, you know, it's just there for that snapshot. Cause some games you're not going to get a chance to see that as much, especially if they're not tested or put in a position tackle, especially if they don't like playing the run game much. Cause then you're like, well, I'm not, I'm not seeing him in a position to tackle at all here. So I don't know what to go off of. Mm -hmm. That was uh, the last of my third round guys. Do you have any other third round guys on your list? I believe I do. Give me one second here. So I think I had Chris Abrams drain in my third round. Okay. Yes. Chris Abrams drain of Missouri. Uh, the other Missouri corner, as it were. Uh, 179. So a little bit on the smaller side. Pretty decent testing. A um, lot of plays made on the ball. He's got great ball skills. 27 passes defensed over the last two years. More than one a game. He was an outside and slot corner in, the, in, in college. So he played inside and outside a lot. So if he has to move inside in the NFL because he's small, he's ready for it. Uh, his press at the line of scrimmage has been solid. He's intelligent in zone. He diagnoses plays at a really high level. He's willing as a tackler. He's just not very good, I feel like. So maybe it's something that can get better, but he is small, so maybe not. Um, he's probably going to be slot only in the NFL because of his size. And his reactive athletic abilities aren't that good. I, I think like his speed is fine, but reactive athleticism is a little bit of a struggle. Um, but I think what is there is enough to be like a late third round pick. Yeah, I, I wasn't... Um quite as high on, on drain. I think what I came to was the conundrum you just talked about where I, I don't know if I, I, the 179 that he came in and weighed at the combine, Brennan, I don't think that that's what he played at. I think he played it more like about 170 or maybe even 165. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I just don't trust cornerbacks down at that weight. Cause he was so thinly. I mean, bring up a picture of him, man. I mean, he just looks, he doesn't look like 180 if you bring him up on a shot, you know, it's just, he's, He's very thin, which is part of why he gets that such speed and quickness is he's so light to be able to do it. And I do like him. Short area quickness, um, played well as an outside corner when he was asked to do it. Like you said, he did good in the slot too when he was asked to do it. Um, I, he was a really guy who's got a lot of patience, maybe because he can trust that speed where it's just he will slowly envelop you in a route like, like a cloud in the sky where it's just suddenly he's taking over the sky and you're like, wow, he just kind of covered that guy. Whereas other guys are snappy in coverage, right, Brendan, where they'll, like you said, the, the click and hitch, hitch where they bop, bop, and they're jumping right on you. You can really feel the moment they're jumping into you in the route and getting you covered. He just kind of does it naturally, which I stood out to me as a little, his little sort of special skill he brought from the, that perspective of things. But you take the smaller show arms, if he is 170 pounds, if that's 31 inch arms on that kind of build, I didn't like the tackling ability. And you did mention, I do believe that, you know, he's going to probably have to move to the slot. And I agree yeah. with you on that. I, he's got to move to the slot. So now we come back around. Can he tackle out of the slot at 170 pounds consistently? Can he play like a linebacker at 170 pounds consistently? I don't think he can. I could be wrong on that. He played, didn't play at the lighter, but he just felt lighter. And especially when it came to tackling, he'd come on and hit running backs. And that it's that thing where, you know, you give up 30, 40 pounds to a guy and you just kind of, boom, you know, you're right. You're, you're, you, there's nothing you can really do. You're just, you're not bringing the, 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 the sand in the pants to be able to come up and withstand that. And that's my, why I dropped him down as far as I did to more of like a six round range, because okay. I didn't think, I didn't think that, yeah, I think he's a guy, a man caught in between two worlds. Who's got a lot of ability, but he's caught in between two different worlds. Mm -hmm. Caught All in right. between two different worlds. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see some part of that, but I think what is there is pretty appealing and intriguing for me. Understood. He certainly is very fast, very quick. All right. Um, I have another one, and we're going to have a big disagreement on this one. This is oh, one of my sleepers. Let's get it. This get is it. the biggest one we've had so far because I really liked what I saw with Nehemiah Pritchett of Auburn. Oh, Nehemiah Pritchett. Okay. He's growing right. me the last day, man. I've, I've been going back and watching the tape a little bit. Mm hmm. So he's good in press. His jabs are really good in press. He's got great long speed, which allows him to hang with fast receivers. He ran a 4 3 6 40, 1 4 9 10 yard split. He's aggressive and strong at the point of catch. 
Change of direction is also really good. Usually doesn't give up separation because he does use that speed well. I think he'll be good in zone also because he reads the play so well. He does need to improve as a run defender and tackler. I suspect he needs to put on a little bit of weight because he's six feet tall, but 190 pounds. So he's got room to add a little bit of weight if he needs to. And he's a little tentative on his click and close, but I feel like that's something that can be learned. You know, I'm thinking about like, you know, that scene in uh, man on fire where Denzel's trying to teach the girl how to, mm -hmm. you know, dive into the water when they hear the starting gun go off. Yeah. I feel like that's something that can be taught. You know, I could be mm -hmm. wrong. It's not always, it doesn't always get taught, but I think he's a little tentative there. But I think there's a lot of potential here. I think he's got a few rough edges you can smooth out. He's uh, kind of one of my sleepers. I did end up putting him in my third. Yeah, I uh, I didn't hate his game. So I want to say that I've, I've put him into the fifth round, Brendan. Um, so I, I definitely don't have him quite where you have him. Um, but he, he's a really intriguing player because of the speed. One, four, nine, 10 yard split. A senior. He's played a lot of football. I mean, I think he's been a four year starter. I think he's improved every single year of college that he's played. Um, he has a lot of the, the pure skills you want from the position, really sure footwork, quick turning hips, the plus speed that you've got moving in any direction. I mean, it's all there. I Part of what was tough on his game, which I wasn't sure of, which I, I don't know if it's the Auburn teaching technique way that they were asking them to do it, but he would play the off corner. He play off corner coverage, Brennan. And then I kept watching him not just bail drop to depth, but it was like he was sprinting to depth at times. And so there wasn't a lot of the tape of watching him actually reacting to what's happening the route. It's just like he's been told, get back there. Just get back there. And I, I, it made it a little bit harder in the overall evaluation for him. Now, I, here's the thing I came back to, though, is 12 receptions given up on 26 targets for 134 yards last year. So he wasn't giving up a lot of catches despite being asked to do that. Um, but it made it a little bit tougher because there were so many of those snaps that I was watching over and over again um, in his evaluation with the tape I had available to me. The tackling I thought was a mixed bag. He'll do it if you absolutely force him to do it. But the want, the will, the I, 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 I'm going to go do this, I, I didn't think it was as much there. Um, I don't think that there's a lot of ball skills either on that side of it and what he's going to offer you. So a guy that has some potential to start that you can find maybe even in the fifth round to me, I, I could say that, Brennan. I think that he's got at least the arm length size and, and build there, but I do think there's some things you have to clean up in his game. To your point, is it, can you clean it up? Yeah, you can. I mean, have, have, show me in more in those off coverage looks, you driving on the ball. Some of this is a lot what I wasn't able to see on his tape more than what was bad on his tape, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. Yeah, I can dig that. He He's one of my sleepers. He's one of my guys. Understandable. He's a good player. And these quarterbacks were all in these areas really good. Even a guy, this guy in a typical draft, Brendan, would be an easy third, probably. Yeah. yeah I don't think I had any other third rounders. All right. Uh, well, let's barrel roll our way into the fourth rounder with my top guy. Another pure is the driven snow cover corner. Brendan, they don't come more pure cover corner than this. Dwight McLuthern out of Arkansas, 6'2", 185. Oh, look that, folks. we got another short arm warrior, 30 and a half inches, this man. Mm -hmm. But likewise, he's got that speed. They got the short arms, but hey, at least they got the wheels. 4'4", 7", 10 yard split. The man can move. Wasn't super explosive on the jumping, Brendan. No, he, can't, he cannot better. jump. He can move, but he, he can't jump. jump. He can't jump. He's he's getting a couple inches off the ground. But uh, he was a, an interesting corner for me. Kind of, a to me, Brendan, a little bit of a nine day on the sides of his game for me, right? Where it's bright, it's bright. And where it's dark, it's dark. Yeah, he's got size, so he's got a chance to play on the outside. Although there are a couple other reasons why maybe he won't be able to. He's got a lot of ball production, seven picks over the last two years, 16 passes defensed, click and close is good. And I know I always say click and close and people in the chat are getting sick of me saying that, but it's a really important skill for these cornerbacks. And they need to be able to click and close. Yep. It's absolutely true, man. It's, yeah. it's the standard issue, especially if you're having a guy playing off coverage. That's one of the main things you're going to call upon wondering, because you know he'll stay on top because he's being given a cheat to stay on top prior to the snap. But can he get down on the route after the snap? Uh, he reads the quarterback's eyes well, good at reading quarterback's eyes. Now, he does pick up a lot of penalties. I think he was one of the more penalized corners last year. Struggles to press, not really good in press, and he won't probably be asked to do it when he's in the um, NFL because he has short arms. Not super interested on running plays. Gets beat over the top, and he has no explosion in his lower body at all. 
So I think he's a pretty reasonable fit for a cover three zone scheme. I don't see too much else here. I'm more like fifth round on him, but not too far away from where you are. Yeah, I, I think he's got a little more hope for getting to the – I think he run a little bit more of a press man situation at times because he just has – there's moments in watching him to me, Brendan, where he will run the route as good as the receiver. And it gets him in trouble for that aggressiveness. It gets him in trouble with the grabbiness you just talked about um, because he's he's trying so hard to get on top of that route to go make a play on the ball and go get himself a pick that everything else doesn't kind of matter and gets sort of to the to the background, including using you know the right technique and staying patient with the route. It just becomes a little bit of an impatience in his uh, in his playing of the route. A little bit below average, I thought, as a run defender. I did just think if you put him in the right right scheme, clean up the grabbiness. He's not going to have a huge top end side, but okay, he gets you to a league average cornerback who can get you a lot of picks every year or get you a collection mm-hmm. of picks every year. And that maybe there's at least value into that. Uh, you know, not a clean prospect, but that what he gives you will work. But it's got to go to the right scheme, Brennan. I think you got to go to something that's aggressive, something that's not asking him to cover for like a long period of time and uh, something that allows him to be aggressive too while mitigating those problems with the holds. Mm-hmm. Okay. Upo, thank you for the ten dollar donation. Upo, I appreciate you for that. It's good to see you in the house too. Says uh, you guys remember a year when so many draft eligible players, especially cornerbacks and defensive linemen, regressed from the previous year. Throw in two of the top three quarterbacks in that group too. Yeah, um, I have noticed that a lot of players played better in twenty twenty two than twenty twenty three. Is the reason why, because of NIL money, making these guys stay longer than they normally would have? In the past, they would have the breakout year and then just go to the NFL. Now they have the breakout year and they're like, well, let me get some of this NIL money first. And then they're not as able to replicate the success of that breakout year. I think you could be onto something. Uh, Just to keep taking your thought process further on this, you're inferring it, I think, a little bit. So let's just speak about it you come back and get the NIL money after your breakout year and you kind of like, I'm fat and happy. I did it. And maybe you don't have your foot on the gas as hard. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe, you know, fate conspired in your favor during that breakout year in a way that it just doesn't, especially if you're playing a position like cornerback where the difference between you having a monster statistical season and having a pedestrian one is you played that one game against that one quarterback who just kept throwing it right to you. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. you played, you know, those two games where you where a couple of balls got tipped and landed in your hands. Like cornerback production tends to be pretty fluky from year to year. It's not a consistent flow of like, I'm going to get six interceptions every year. No, it's like I got 10 interceptions this year. This year I got like two. This year I got like eight. This year I got one. Mm-hmm. So combination. Yeah. I, I think it's certainly certain positions like that. That's the case, Brennan. I think there's other ones to Upo's point where you see it and you said from the edge class, we saw it from some of the middle linebackers that we talked about who you thought this guy was going to be here. And then he went back and then a lot of the guys that had to go back to college this year, I think at times just had kind of underwhelming prior years from their last year. Mm-hmm. I, I think if I was pressed to give an answer on this Upo, I, I think it does clearly just come down to everyone reacts differently to getting a lot of money. And when you're a young man at 18, 19 years old, and somebody is giving you hundreds of thousands of dollars, suddenly it it, it's hard to always react in the mature way of, okay, let me put my hundred thousand in the bank and get back in the gym. And I'm gonna get up at five in the morning. Right. We're gonna get our two a days on the jet. Like it's, it's, it's easy for guys like you and me to sit here and be like, that's what you should do. Is it your commitment? Do you love the game? Are you, (laughs) but it's also like human nature is, I'm an 18 year old guy who's got a couple hundred thousand dollars. You know, so yeah. Let's, you know, we're going to go have some fun, you know, and um, fun means less working, less working means not as good a player the next year. So uh, I think it is a factor, Upo, but I think this is also a good thing at the end of the day, because now when you used to have that question, when you came into a draft about a player about whether or not he would react poorly to once he did get paid. Now you can say, well, we've seen him get paid. We know how he'll react. We know that he'll still love ball, whether he still will give all he's got. So it turns into a really a thing that helps Teams and and their evaluation, I think, more than hinders them. Yeah. And um, also, I guess another part of it would be they feel like when they've had that breakout year, that is what everybody's going to look at. And if they have a lesser year the next year, it's not that big of a deal because I I did it that one time. So, like, you know, Caleb did not play nearly as well in 2023 as he did in 2022, but I don't think anybody held that against him. They were like, well, he lost Jordan Addison. He lost some of his offensive line. 
and he still played really well. So we're not going to hold it against him. So yeah. I think that there's some truth to that. Now it's not always true. JV on Cohen, I think was looking a lot better coming out of 2022 than he does in 2023. And it does seem like some people are questioning him because of that. Yeah. It, it is uh, it is an oddity too, though, this year, Brendan. I think it felt it feels like more this year than we've seen in recent years. There's only a couple of guys that have those underwhelming hands, but there's I can go across every positional group and point you with guys that thought this was guys going to be higher. He fell down. You got your Kalen Kings types who fell off a complete cliff. We're going to talk about Kalen King in a second out of Penn State, and it's mm -hmm. like, dude, that guy was going to be a top ten player and fell off a. He's fallen off a complete cliff from that that year he just had. You know, some guys just like, dude, you just like forgot how to play the sport. Like, what the what the hell happened? I mean, he's some. It's not just bad down years. It's like, Jesus, you like, you went bad. You know, you broke bad. You know, you Brian Cranston that thing. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but uh, thank you, Upo. Great question. Can't think, can't say that it's been a while since I've uh, seen run into this kind of thing before. So it's been a bit, a, very much an oddity for us in evaluating. It makes it hard too, Brennan. What do you go off of? Do you go off the prior year at that point, Brennan, or do you do the math on what I just talked about and say, well, you got to bring, you got to put that in your evaluation. So uh, you know you're going to have to knock them down a lick. You know that that final season's got to carry the the strength over it, or is it case by case? It is case by case. I think. I, I think it has to be. Yeah. I think it does as well, but I do think it's worthy if you knock them a bit to say, Hey, that year you didn't bring it that year. You need to bring it. Then to me, it's very fair to say, I'm not leaning on that two year ago tape, unless there's an injury situation or some explanation for what happened. Like you lost all the talent around you. Uh, I'm not leaning on that prior year's tape to hope that's who you truly are. You need to be the last tape you put out should be the best tape in, in the evaluation process. I think. Mm -hmm. I know that's a no-brainer, Brenda, but I mean, that's where you, so I think you can get yourself talked into the year two stuff too much, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, we'll keep moving here through my fourth round here, my second fourth round player, who will be Decamerian Richardson, another Ole Miss player, 6'2", 188. Nice arms on this guy, 32 and 3 eighths inch. 43440, another blazing fast 40 time, 148, 10 yard split, awesome broad jump, pretty good vert. Testing numbers were good with this kid. Uh, what did you think about Mr. Richardson? Uh, well, he's really, really interesting when you see those testing numbers and the length. And, you know, physically, he's just about everything you could want, right? He's, mm -hmm. he's got it all. Uh, insane number of tackles over the last two years for a corner, by the way. He might have more tackles than any corner in the country over yeah. the last two years. Big and long with the wingspan to get his hand on passes frequently if he wants to. Uh, phenomenal straight line speed and acceleration. Really good tackler. Really good at intelligently attacking run plays. Like he doesn't, uh, you know, he reads run blocking. And then he makes a play based on what he sees the run blocking doing. He's got recovery speed to get beat and get back in the play like Woolen does. You can beat him and he'll get you back. Um, doesn't really have the short area quickness or change of direction skills. I would like his hip transitions are segmented. I don't think his football IQ is all there yet. I, I, I feel like he's raw. I feel like he's really mm -hmm. raw and he needs to find something he does that works really well other than just run support. So I think you are definitely taking him as a project, but it's a project I would spend a fourth round pick on because there's so much fun stuff here it is very reek woolen-y honestly mm, great way to put it fantastic way of putting it um and that's what really i think your evaluation basically hits the mark to pretty much my outlook on this player as well um he does play the run well but he is very rough in coverage i've seen an out route on a tight end turn him around in a circle you know a simple guy just running up to the stem of the route cutting it out and he does the whoop goes around and you're going come on to carry and like let's you you it's just a tight end you got that man um, so you got to you're going to have to take him a long way in the coverage and his awareness and his uh, understanding of route concepts and his just getting a better natural feel for how to play the position. Gave up over 400 yards receiving, so he did get picked on as much as I think just about any. I mean, 67 targets this last year, Brennan. He was picked on as any much any cornerback I've seen that we scouted in this draft. Not a lot of ball skills as well, but the willingness to play run and the fact that he couldn't run with anybody makes him a guy to me that is a guy that would be very much an attractive target round for as that developmental guy. This is a project, you know, all you got are the beams in the house, Brendan. We don't have any of the floors. We don't have the walls, you know, in no insulation, but once you build it up, you could have yourself a, a hell of a home. 
I'm I'm inclined to agree. Uh, this is another guy who Pete would have been all over. Pete would have oh, loved this guy. This, this would have been a Pete Carroll special. No, no mm -hmm. doubt about that guy here. Uh, we'll keep the building, by the way, just something to keep in mind. That is that is true. They're taking his pictures down, though. So I don't know what that if that means will be, as, <laughs> you know, it's hard to say with if you're going to as much Pete in the building at that point when you're doing that. Right. Um, keeping it moving through this fourth round, a guy I didn't have any testing numbers on, but uh, Kalen Carson, CC at a Wake Forest, six foot, 200 pound kid, a little bit undersized arm, 31 three eighths inches. I put him in my middle to uh, late-ish fourth round for me here, Brennan. Yeah, I uh, did. A, I was a little more fifth round on him. I like the way he plays. He plays with a lot of fire, tenacity. Um, should be good in zone. Should be a really good zone corner. A lot of fight at the catch point. He's a good mirror when he's putting man coverage. He mirrors well. His hip flipping is fluid. Good size. No interceptions in the last two years is uh, at least noteworthy. <laughs> now these guys don't um, need ball skills, do they? <laughs> yeah. Um, and he struggles so much to turn and play the ball. He always plays the man. So he's going to get penalized a lot if he can't figure that out. And because his arms are short, or at least short relative to the rest of the league, I do wonder if he's going to end up in the slot. But that's a little bit harder to determine. They're not that short, but they are shorter than I think you typically see on the outside. So I went fifth round on him. Yeah, I can I can understand an evaluation of seeing that that's where he is. I, I think I saw a little bit more in mine that I I know the testing numbers aren't here with him, Brennan, but he did feel to me like a four four one five five ten yard split kind of guy on tape to me. So I trust his speed and quickness out there. The arms aren't terribly short; it's just a little bit under the thirty two. Real aggressive kind of corner, full of feistiness, and he's constantly just it, uh, constant energy, you know, constantly moving, constantly getting things going. Um, playing played mainly in off coverage. Um, I think that's where he's best. He does play a little bit of man, but zone is where you want to, I think, have him out. He's got quick, quick feet, ability to drive on the ball. Um, got the speed to stay over the top. Felt like he tackled pretty strongly overall. He does have to clean up some things in coverage. Um, that, uh, you know, he just at, at times I think will get a little bit listless out there and just suddenly get beat on something that's pretty rudimentary that he shouldn't get beat on. Where he's just like, Dirt, that that took you, that got you. Okay. You just held up for five straight snaps on much tougher routes there to keep cover than you have. So I don't know if he just kind of, you know, sometimes had a little bit of check out there. Um, 400 yards, giving up four touchdowns this past year. Brendan, a little bit of grabbiness and coverage on top of that. Um, that's a big part you got to kind of clean up. But I do think he has the raw goods, which is why I put him in this fourth round. If I thought he was more one four five one six, I probably put him in that fifth round range where you put him. But this is where you sometimes like to have that testing numbers to lean on a little bit with that first halfing to guess. Mm -hmm. This is nice where the teams right. get those GPS times that they're starting to get, where they got the actual field testing time so they can know for sure with him. Yeah, like um, there was an article written about this recently. They were talking about Brock Bowers because he still has not run a 40, obviously. And mm -hmm. some people were trying to guess, like, what's his 40 time? And mm -hmm. there were a bunch of answers. They were like, 4'8", 4, 4'5'6", four, 4'6'3". And it's like, you know they have those GPS things on the players now, right? Like, you can yeah. probably figure this out very accurately. And then somebody's like, one of the scouts, anonymous scouts, was like, I bet he runs a 4'8'40", and that's why he won't do it. It's like... Okay, um, I understand that you can't watch him test because he didn't test, but you can watch his tape, right? I, the, yeah, the thing I don't get with that is like they gave him fly sweeps from the tight end position. Does that track to you that a guy running a four eight is going to be handed a fly sweep and do it well, uh, like bust that thing out down the field? I mean, he's going to be a guy more about breaking tackles at that point because he's so big and hard to bring down a bit, but. That in itself shows you that if you give that ball to that kind of guy in that play and he's able to round that edge, he get the edge, especially on that play, that there's some quickness to him there. Maybe maybe not the full speed, but at the very least some quickness. Right. It's odd. Yeah. I would like to see him test, though, knowing, knowing what Bowers has. But if it allows, maybe if it allows him to land in 16, he can not run all day, Brennan. Like, don't, yeah, do exactly. a bench, don't do a one bench press rep. In fact, do one bench press rep on the 225. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be great. Um, keeping it moving here through the fourth round, another guy might be a little bit higher on you than you on this one. A guy that kind of grew on me the more I watched him on his tape, which was uh Elijah Jones, um, a kid out of Boston College. Uh, re another really great testing times, another little bit slightly shorter arms, 
Um, four, four, one, five, four, 10 yard split, but a 42 and a half inch vert, almost 11 feet on the broad Brennan. This kid is, uh, to me, a very, very interesting player here in the fourth round. Yeah, I have him in my fourth as well. Uh, really good ball hawk. Really, really impressive ball skills overall, I think. Mm-hmm. He's long, He's relative to this draft class, actually kind of long. Like, I know 31 and a half inch arms doesn't stand out typically. In this class, it does. Uh, five years of starting experience at Boston College. Smooth flow from backpedal to running when he flips his hips. Good tackler. Uh, sometimes I feel like he gets out physical because he doesn't have the strength that you would love to see. Um, slow acceleration. I think he'll be really good in zone as a ball hawk corner who knows how to read route combos and make plays on his read. I don't know if he'll be so good anywhere else, but that's enough, right? That's uh, mm-hmm. most of what you're going to be asked to do in a lot of defenses. So I say fourth round. Yeah, I ball hawk that plays the run uh, right there to build off of with some coverage skills and certain types of coverage schemes are going to be just enough. Like I say, that's enough. Um, I, I'm not going to comp him to like a Richard Sherman type, but I thought that there's some Richard Sherman intelligence in his anticipating of routes, um, the great late hands that he can bring up at the catch point, both to get picks and knock the ball away. Uh, he gives you some versatility to play in the slot. He had a third of his snaps at the slot, Brendan. He even had 35 snaps as a box safety last year. So you talk about the flexibility that might appeal to Seattle. Here you go. Seven picks over the last two years, five last year, 21st in uh, college football as far as his rating by PFF. Um, only 13 receptions allowed on 40 targets for 194 yards. And uh, I did think he was strong in the running game, uh, much better than some of the corners in this class that we've looked at, Brendan, that have just a ton of missed tackles on their resume and just not as many with him. I, he is better in zone than man. You got to put him back in zone. That's a little bit of that Richard Sherman thing. Like, get him a chance. Maybe it's that Boston College education. But uh, give him a chance to sort of sit back there and diagnose and figure out what's kind of going on and then give him that opportunity to jump and pull the trigger and he's going to get some picks for you. So solid all-around player. You get this kid in the fourth round. That's some great value, I think, for this guy because I I have a lot of good feeling about his floor getting there. Maybe not the huge ceiling, but the good floor that you can reach with him. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm about where you are on him, I think. So pretty good synergy there. All right, let's keep it going here to uh, another corner. I think this is another kid out of uh, Georgia. Um, another, I believe, going to be, I think, a, I believe I've got this kid down as a slot specialist. And that's going to be Ty Key Smith out of Georgia, our second corner out of Georgia we're taking a look at here. I think I had him listed as a safety. Is he not a safety? He played slot last year. Okay. Okay, mm-hmm. I see. Okay, I do have him, though, so okay. Yeah, he's. Uh, I think they might have moved. Uh, the thing about Georgia's defense is, of course, remember, it's that unusual one with the fronts they use and the back end they use and blitz heavy, and it's it's got some positional list elements to it in some of the players and how they play with that with some of those games that they do run mm-hmm. um before four six one five eight thirty six inch vert okay testing numbers for a slot mm-hmm. nothing phenomenal there brennan five ten two oh two right below 32 inch long arms so everything's just on the surface of this good enough what did you see from him beyond the surface of it uh for a smaller guy he plays really physically mm-hmm. um burst looks good on tape even though it didn't test all that well um, capable of holding up well in man coverage should be really good on special teams at the minimum, even if he doesn't necessarily cut in on defense. Now I do wonder if he'll have a shorter career because he is small and plays so physically. He might be, mm. he might, you know, the star that burns twice as bright burns both out candles, both ends, something like that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. um, so I'm a little bit worried about that. He gets beaten over the top sometimes because he is so aggressive and I feel like he does miss a fair few tackles because his short, um, his like reactive athleticism struggles against elusive ball carriers. But I do like him. I do wonder if he ends up as a safety in the NFL. But either way, I'd say fourth round is about right. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a possibility you could slide him into safety. You talked about the physicality, man. I really liked how he took on pullers and and how he got off disengaged off those blocks for being such an undersized guy you yeah. know he'll stick he'll stick his nose in those offensive linemen at the second level um i thought his suddenness was what stood out as much anything in his game where you come back to that 158 and you go man he plays more like a 153 152 it's 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 quicker than that i mean whether it's on top of quarterbacks quickly or getting on top of ball carriers fast the quickness in space shows up 
Only 180, 187 yards given up out of the slot this year. Uh, many of those two, Brendan, I felt like were manufactured. You know, the slot's got so many of those bubble screens and right. quick little throws where you just, you're out. Where, when you just have him run the route, he was staying in coverage and staying sticky in coverage. Really, really sticky. I want to get that across with him, I felt like, um, as a slot. And that just stood out to me. He does get misdir- he, he can get misdirected. It's rare. Um, sometimes he doesn't always clearly read whether it's run or pass. But the, he's got a high quality burst that works really well for the slot. And being such a willing tackler, being a guy that I think can have some fluidity in what he plays, whether he can play safety or not, Brendan, he could be that guy that you start out as a slot and then you move him into a safety look post snap, like we talk about Mike McDonald's defense doing with other positions. Or you can move him into being an outside corner post snap, and he could probably handle that stuff too. So I think he could be a potentially interesting target for our Seahawks in that way. Um, and again, you mentioned safety. Maybe even got some of that safety upside to where that can be his natural potential landing spot. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm uh, uh, predicting here. All right, I've got uh, two guys left in the fourth round here for me. And this is a guy we talked about a second ago, a kid out of Notre Dame, a real big kid, one of the big corners in this draft. That's uh, Cam Hart, 6'3", 202. Got the long arms on this guy, Brennan. 33-inch long arms, 4'5". All the six three guys just ran down for four five, right? Uh, one five seven ten yard split did do a four inch vert, <clears throat> almost got 11 inch broad, so that stuff was good. The three cone was good for a six three guy, seven one two, not bad, mm-hmm. right? For a bigger guy, there, yeah. So, um, the size is there. The testing was a little disappointing overall, considering what the hype was around this guy. Like, this guy was expected to be like a super athlete. Um, but still when you're six, three and you have 33 inch arms, you can get away with a little bit more. So he's really explosive, should be able to be good in zone. And I think he'll be able to get away with a little bit of man, although his lack of speed will hurt, uh, used to play receiver and his understanding of the receiver position helps him a lot. Now, as he plays corner, uh, he uses his length. Well, when he presses, not afraid to tackle and he's got good click and close. Um, he's. He wasn't very, it's kind of weird that a guy this long only had eight passes defensed over the last two seasons combined. Like the production doesn't match the profile. Like why isn't this guy making plays on the ball constantly? Mm-hmm. Um, he's also going to lose effectiveness the further away he gets from the line of scrimmage. When you ask him to cover nine routes, I feel like he's not comfortable there. But um, I would still go fourth round on him. I'm a, I, I think that testing has to make you a little bit concerned combined with his lack of production. But there's mm. clearly a very interesting player here. Yeah, he's he's got some ability to him. I, I really like how he jumps on top of the stem of the route, um, which may be a little bit of the reason why he doesn't have as many com- incompletions on the first point of it being that he so often shows the quarterback him take – he's off coverage – playing zone, but then we'll jump the route on the stem of the route. So he takes from the quarterback, then the view of their separation, or there's an opening here for me to throw. So it's a lot of what he does. I think Brennan is dissuade throws in his direction. He was only targeted 28 times on the season, which is incredibly low for even some of the guys that we've looked at this year. And I think it comes from kind of how he plays that stem of the route. Um, If you put him up in man, he gets really grabby and he's grabby otherwise too. And it's like playing it off coverage is like, you know, if you've ever seen a thumb sucker that they put a glove on the thumb sucker, that's like him in off coverage where he has the ability, I think, to play up and press, but it's just he can't help himself but to grab and you force him in off coverage and he can't grab anything. He's 10 yards off coverage. He has to trust his hips. He has to trust his eyes. He has to go and try to jump on the uh, on the route. Um, 21 tackles this last year. Uh, not a big not a big tackler, not a big guy getting in on the run game. When he does, though, Brennan, three forced fumbles. So one one every eight tackles this year, he was causing a forced fumble, which uh, is interesting with him, but not really a lot of that he's wanting to do. And he does have – he's had surgeries on both of his shoulders, so there is a little bit of concern here too with him on how the medicals check out with both of those shoulders. You put right. him in the fourth round, though. You did say, yeah, round. yeah. I did f- say fourth. That that length and size is tough to ignore. It is, and the fact that he can kind of somewhat drive on routes where sometimes those guys, six three guys, are going to try to stay on top and leave the stuff underneath opened up, stands out a little bit with him. So, like yeah. his game. Last fourth round guy for me is going to be Jerrion Jones, a six foot, 190 pound corner with little baby T Rex arms, 30 inch long arms, but another four three guy, another one five, low one five, 10 yard split guy, another guy, you know, 
tickle in there, the 40, 40 yeah. inches on the vertical leap and 11, 11 feet on the broad. Yeah. Um, I had this guy in my fourth. I may have to bump him to my fifth though, because uh, I've been told that he's one of the worst tacklers ever. <laughs> like apparently he averaged one missed tackle for every 10 snaps he played, according to somebody in my comments. Mm, so like, he's one of the worst tacklers who's ever lived. Um, he is fast. He does have great explosiveness in his lower body. Uh, good ball production last year, three interceptions, a really high PFF grade. Uh, overall testing was notable. He's pretty physical as well. He's really good at throwing receivers off the route at the start with his press makes a lot of positive plays in zone upper level speed allows him to hang with nine routes. He's smart in how he handles plays as well. I'm not a big fan of his click and close. I don't think he triggers fast enough. His acceleration up to top speed is mediocre. He's not a good tackler, like I said. And he's got very short arms, 30 inch flat. That's tough. Mm. So I I go somewhere between the fourth and the fifth. It depends on how much you care about the tackling. Yeah. Um, I, I think the thing for me with the tackling was he flashes the ability to be a strong rack wrap up tackler. It just comes in that he leans on the shoulder tackling stuff too much. And then he just kind of ricochets off of guys. Cause you know, that's it. It's not, you, you can only do so much of that. Um, it's hard to be the seventh highest graded cornerback by PFF and be completely miserable in tackling. Right. Like that, I, there's definitely some holes to the tackling game. I'll definitely, I'm not saying that he's, he's like a remarkable tackler, but it, the tape that I saw, it, it wasn't some, let me just put it this way. There were, there were much more egregious guys for me. Uh, you know, he doesn't always want to get off the blocks. He does do the shoulder tackling stuff a little bit too much for my flavor, but he does provide you a hell of a cover corner guy that does flash the ability to tackle. There are times on tape you're watching him wrap up and do it properly, um, engage the proper technique. Um, I think he's really good in, in a zone coverage kind of system. I do think the 30 inch arms move him to the slot at the next level, Brendan, but that he has the mo mo mobility to hold up with that. I think I liked a little bit more of his short area athleticism than you did on that side of it. I feel like he can trust his speed. He sometimes with his speed will show off being an ability to almost cover through two zones of space and, and how fast he can get from point A to point B, which really did stand out to me and could be really useful when you're talking about a slot guy playing having to go from a variety of different places, get from here over to here, and he can get there faster than other people could. Um, he only had eight snaps as a blitzer, but had two snacks, snap, two sacks, a hit, and a hurry. So he actually, when he was at, when he was allowed to kind of cut it loose and you know become a little bit of a blitzer, he showed an ability to do that. Maybe have a little bit of an upside, especially coming off the slot. You do a little bit more of that, Brendan, if you're, I think, put in there a bit. So he has, he has that ability. I guess I'm just leaning in a little bit more heavily on the flashes I saw of what he did good he can more round out um, versus maybe what others might see on those lack of in between the flashes saying that's more of the player he is. Yeah. I, that tackling thing really just kind of threw me like that's, that's really, really bad. And that may not be fixable because it's so bad, but every, uh, the other stuff's pretty good. So I'm not going to completely bail on him. Yeah. No, he's definitely got something to offer at least. Uh, did you have any other uh, fourth round guys on your list? Um, I believe I had a few. I think I had Andrew Phillips from Kentucky here, which Andrew is a Phillips. little higher than you did. A little bit higher than me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's super explosive. Broad jump was 11 foot three inches, which is one of the best broads we've ever seen from any corner. His vert was 42 inches. Similarly, one of the best verts ever for a corner. Uh, really good tackling and run support has the athleticism to pull off man coverage can do press man stuff as well. He shows potential, good click and close disruptive at the point of catch. Doesn't have great ball skills. When the ball's in the air, he seems a little bit lost, probably going to get flagged in the NFL because of it too, because he ends up playing the man, not the ball, uh, misses too many tackles from poor fundamentals. I feel like he does a little bit of ankle diving. So mm -hmm. even though I think that his willingness is there, it's going to have to be cleaned up a little bit. Um, no interceptions in his career is also a little bit head-scratching because he's played a decent amount. Um, I'm not enamored, but I do think about him as like a fourth-round pick, probably late fourth. Uh, the lack of ball skills and tackling uh, fundamentals are concerning, but I still think would put him somewhere around the fourth. Yeah, I dropped him into that sixth round range. 
uh, off coverage cornerback, does a lot of cover three bail dropping in that particular scheme out there at Kentucky. Like I say, just nice, good hip flip drive, explosive explosion on routes. Um, but the thing that stood out to me with him and watching him play coverage is there's a tentative nature to him. There's a lack of aggression to him. He's got a ton of starting experience, but it's literally like he's walking on eggshells on the football field sometimes. Um, credited with giving up 39 completions for 438 yards this past year. The tackling that you mentioned, I think, is on point completely. It is a struggle. I don't know that I I was as much believing as you were that there was the willingness or the interest to do it, and getting off blocks and fighting hard. I think that that's a big question with him. I think he does too much guessing at the top of the stem of the route. There is no route anticipation with this guy. Everything's got to be reacting at the last minute to what's happening in front of him, which then somewhat neutralizes a little bit of that athleticism. And as you also said, despite playing all of that time, the ball skills just aren't there. Um, so uh, to me, more of an athlete than a football player. Tools are there, but I just don't think um, there, there's a natural feel in this. Another one of those not natural feel kind of players where I just felt like he is just doesn't really kind of have an understanding for what he's exactly doing out there. Are you? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can, uh, I, I can agree with some of that, but I think there's enough to warrant like a late fourth personally. Understood. Understood. Definitely. Definitely can't mm -hmm. argue with those testing numbers. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, I also had Jalen Simpson. Did you have him? Some places list him as a safety. So you may not have him as a corner. I think I had him as a safety. Yeah, I feel like he can do both, which is appealing in and of itself. But um, yeah, we can go ahead and save him for the show tomorrow, um, next week then. Okay, yeah, let's push him on that one because we got a lot on these. Um, um, who else do you have on yours? Uh, I think I had DJ James in my fourth round. Okay. Um, well, Auburn guy, another Auburn corner, six feet flat, 175. Uh, pretty good 40 time he ran, 1-5 flat, 10-yard split. Uh, 18 passes defense over the last two years, good PFF grades, played outside and inside, got good ball skills, should be flexible across main and zone, smart player. He can diagnose action in front of him when he's looking at it and then react appropriately to that action. Pretty good tackler. Some of the issues, he gets fooled by eye candy. He's somebody who could do a little bit of biting hard on like a double move and getting beat over the top because of it. Um... He's doesn't have the play speed to keep up with speedster wide receivers. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really shed blockers. He's a little bit small and can get distracted sometimes by like uh, people uh, about by like backfield stuff, by like stuff happening in the backfield ends up spying on the backfield, gets beat over the top. But um, I think the ball skills and the uh, football IQ make him desirable enough to say he's a fourth round pick. Yeah, another guy that just uh, so many of the snaps were pure outside off coverage zone corner playing the bail drop technique into cover three, you know, where it's uh, it, it, he stays on top. He doesn't get beat over the top. I don't know if maybe it's Auburn teaching their guys to do that that way and go so hard with how far with how much depth they, they do get. I think we talked Pritchett was the other guy that did a lot of this. Um, so it, I think it is a little bit of how they're taught they're they're asked to do it, but it does lead to him giving up a lot of stuff underneath. 32 receptions, 385 yards given up in coverage this year. I also think at 175 pounds, another guy that had to gain a little bit of weight to get to 175 uh, for when he tested, and a, a guy that does get ca does get bullied at the catch point where he goes up and he tries to get up there, and if you have a bigger receiver out there, he's just sometimes going to have times that there's not a whole hell of a lot he can really do about it, which is why I dinged him down just to the fifth versus the fourth, so we don't have a big drop between where we see him here, Brendan. Um, but he is – he does have some nice natural athleticism and some explosion when he does engage it. He just wasn't engaging it a lot. Um, he's just okay in run defense, tackling okay in that department. The effort, though, does have times where it's close to atrocious. He just doesn't seem to be interested in tackling and stopping the run. And I'm sorry to keep saying this, folks, but there are some corners in this draft, many of them, that just they won't get off blocks. They won't engage the run. I mean, you can't even get to the point of does he sink his hips and lay proper tackling form? You don't even get to that because they don't get through the first three processes to get to that spot. And uh, it just has me on a lot of these guys over and over again going, not good tackler, not good tackler, not good tackler. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, the, there was just too many negatives for me to keep him in that fourth round where I want to see a little more upside. Mm -hmm. But fifth and round. I, yeah, I think that's all I had in the fourth. 
All right, we'll turn this on into the uh, fifth round here for me. And my first guy in the fifth round is going to be Marcellus Dial mm-hmm. out of sort of South Carolina, six foot 190, 32 inch long arms, four, four, six, one, five, five, 10 yard split. Those kind of the bare, those good bare minimum metrics across the board, but then he does turn in some good explosive numbers with the nearly 41 inch vert and 11 foot broad almost. Yeah, um, he did not make my cut because I didn't want to do more. I didn't want to add even more corners to my list. So I did not have a chance to look at him. So this one's all yours. No worries. He's in the top of my fifth round. Um, smooth, effortless kind of movement when it doesn't look like he's playing hard, where he's perfectly balanced, gliding step for step with the receiver. Um, he's best when he's playing press and running man coverage, easy speed, catch up speed. His footwork is top notch. His initial hip flip is also impressive, which just keeps him on top of routes. It's not tenacious in the run game, but does more than enough, more than many corners in this draft in that respect of things. He does have a thing where he sometimes almost seems like he'll drift off in coverage. Like this is too easy. And then he gets himself in trouble where quarterbacks will take advantage of it. Um, did give up his share of receptions, did give up his share of, uh, catch, you know, catches and yards this year, not, not egregious, but you know, he will get, you know, picked on a little bit with that. Um, not as much on the ball skills again there too, but a bit of a moment of truth mangler where it's better than just completely being cam Hart, For instance, you mentioned he's a draper, right? I'm going to take my six foot three body and just get it over the top of you when the ball is coming in route, get my big arms up around you. And that'll be all I do, at least with this guy. He'll kind of be one of those moment of truth manglers where we'll knock the ball out at that moment of truth. But uh, solid, solid cornerback prospect in the fifth round. Don't expect a ton from him, but just like how he played the game and how it kind of there, there is a natural. We talk about lack of natural and some of these guys, their feel for what they're doing. This there, there's a natural feel with him. Okay, keeping it on moving. Let's go to Wazoo. Uh-huh. I know uh, Snail will be happy out there if he's listening. We got uh, Chow Smith. Wade, five ten, Washington State corner, lit it up at the Senior Bowl, one eighty four. Tiny in, tiny arms, folks. We got some alligator arms all over the place, and I'm not talking about short passes over the middle. I'm talking about tiny arms, thirty and one fourth inch arms, four five four forty yard dash, one five five. So hits those marks, thirty four inch uh, vert, ten five broad, kind of average numbers across the board. Mm-hmm. Maybe slightly smaller than you like, certainly shorter arm than you like, Brennan. Now, as a Husky, can you look at a Cougar without hating your heart, or do you do you just mm-hmm. have to just put it on the to put it on the table for a second? You know, I got to be honest. For most of my lifetime, the rivalry has been pretty. You know, Washington oh. State oh, has had go. like one really great team <laughs> in the last twenty years. The team that probably would have gone to the playoff if we didn't win uh, the Apple. Remember that was the, the snow game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. That's a- I, <laughs> That's a very Western Washington passive aggressive answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I hate Oregon a lot more. I hate the Trojans a lot more. I hate oh, okay. uh, St- even Stanford, honestly, because those Harbaugh Stanford teams were an absolute nightmare. <clears throat> to yeah. <deal with. clears throat> so I don't know. I, I usually, you know, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I end up kind of rooting for the Cougars a lot because it makes the conference look better. Well, I think to your point, like you said, they've had some hard luck and it's hard not to go, well, we want you guys at least somewhat legitimate. And when I was growing up, you had the, the Ryan Leaf, you had the Drew Bledsoe, you know, and you had some cast of characters around that that could become legitimate NFL players to where, you know, they could challenge Washington in that Apple Cup in a way. And it does seem like it has become very, very, very one-sided. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I, I would have no problem with it. Um, I think you liked him a little bit more than I did. Not too different though. I think he's good in zone, really good at reading routes, identifying routes. Uh, quick trigger from his back pedal, so the click and close is nice. Can tackle, good run support. Has played man and zone while mm-hmm. he was at Washington State. But he's small, so he'll probably be slot only, especially with those short arms. Mm. He's grabby, going to get flagged a decent amount, I suspect, unless he can clean that up. Not great ball skills. I feel like he plays the man, not the ball. And not that this matters for the NFL because he won't be doing it, but press coverage is hit or miss. So I feel like he's a good college player who will lose a lot of his value in the NFL because the arm length becomes that much more of a killer in the NFL. Um, I think he'll be fine as a slot corner who stays in zone coverage, but won't be much more than that. I'd say sixth round on him. 
Yeah, it's uh, definitely going to be interesting to see what he's going to do to work around that length and if he can have any potential hold up inside or if it is full slot because it could be just slots where he's got to go. He does have quick, loose hips that would fit him well to go to the slot. Um, I thought he was really competitive and physical in a really great way at the catch point, especially not that he got his head around your assessment is correct. And that he doesn't, you know, really look around. He's more just going to try to get himself in front of the, <laughs> the receiver. He did get two interceptions during senior bowl week, uh, during the senior bowl game, um, after a really strong week. So he's had a good pre-draft process. That's for sure. Uh, but yeah, a little over aggressive sometimes causes him to hold a bit in, in uh, coverage and the run defense is highly inconsistent when he's engaged, he'll come up and stick his nose in there. He'll use great tackling form when he's not engaged. It's a lot of missed tackles. So it, it kept kind of going back and forth between the tape I saw and him with that. Um, and you're not going to get, I think a lot of interceptions despite those two picks of the senior bowl. He just doesn't get his head around, you know, quite enough. So thoughts, thoughts still, even if you have him as a floor guy at slot that he could find a way to, you know, fit into maybe becoming a, a starter in there. But, uh, I could see six round on it too. Yeah. Uh, keeping it on moving here. Let's go with the uh, next guy I've got on my list. Who's going to be a kid named Kalen Carson out of Wake Forest. I think we already, did we, talk, we, we talked about him. Yeah, we talked about him. My bad. Keep it going. Yeah. Here. Uh, Isaiah Johnson. Then did I have him there? Uh, I had Isaiah Williams, Isaiah Adams. No, I don't have the Isaiah. <laughs> I don't have the Isaiah Johnson variant. This is all you. Another six foot three corner in this draft, Brandon. There's about five of these guys. Four six four. So the speed issues are there, but he did do a thirty eight and a half inch vert, eleven inch broad. So the the explosive numbers were good. Kind of his patented move is jumping comeback routes off of off coverage. Another guy to keep off coverage. Don't want him to flip his hips. Um, really weird is that in, when he gets up in off coverage, bread and if you watch him, he puts his head over his feet, he gets so low. So he gets really low in his stance and his head gets over his feet. Like he's skiing. It's kind of wild to watch, um, stays patient on his bail drops, um, capable hitter for the position. It's a double-edged sword. Cause he can sometimes become that shoulder tackler guy rather than the wrap up guy, which causes the missed tackles for a guy at six foot three that shouldn't have it. It's got 32 and seven eighths inch, seven eighths inch long arms. So uh, he has the prerequisite, you know, size with that type of stuff. Um, if the receiver can get him to flip his hips, the receiver is usually going to find his way to getting open. So he's got the issue with being a bigger guy that just can't flip his hips. Gave up 400 yards in coverage. Okay, ball skills. Um, contested catch situations, he's going to put his long arms to use. This is one of those guys that no doubt Pete Carroll would have liked quite a bit. But at 24 years old, I believe he is also probably topped out. And uh, what he is is what he is. But still, fit with the right scheme. Let him stay off coverage. Let him stay cover three. Let him stay on top. Let him kind of use his big size. And he is a pretty good run defender overall. He can take on blocks and whatnot with that. Then in the right kind of scheme, maybe he can grind his way to starting eventually. Okay. Not bad. Next up, I've got Jarvis Brownlee out of L uh, Louisville. This is mm -hmm. another fifth round guy for me. Yeah. And for me as well. Okay. 5'10, yeah. 194. No, no testing numbers. Another short in short armed, short arm dude, dear man. A lot of these guys. Yeah. Um, some experience playing slot as well as playing outside and the slot experience will help because he'll probably play the slot in the NFL. Change of direction is quick and explosive has uh, good jamming skills at the line of scrimmage. Uh, reads route patterns and acts well in that read also has the awareness to hang in zone is a little physically weak. He's going to get bullied by bigger receivers. Jake Bobo would have fun with him. Yes, sir. DK Metcalf would have fun with him. Dominate him. Mm -hmm. um, probably will be full-time slot in the NFL because he is a little bit smaller. Um, not, he didn't test, but my impression is that he's a pretty average athlete overall. I don't think he stands out remarkably well in that area. Um, not very disruptive as the, at the catch point. You'd like to see him be a little more relentless trying to rip the ball out at the catch point. So I think he'll be valuable enough to be a fifth round pick. I think he'll be a decent slot corner and he has the reactive athleticism to stick with his man from that position. Yeah. I thought he was a gritty man corner who was asked at times on that outside to play and played some slot to play like a linebacker in his, in the way that they used him a bit, which I think is going to lend itself really well to when with Jarvis moving into the slot. 
Um, he played most of his not snaps on the outside, but there was about a quarter of the snaps to the inside. So he's got the understanding. He's been in there too. So it's not going to be new at the pro level. I just thought he played really angry against the run, especially compared to a lot of these other cornerbacks in this draft. I, I, I really underlined strong tackler on my notes for him. I uh, did give up 300 yards in coverage, four touchdowns this year. So a lot of that's just going to be the, the him playing on the outside at times where he's too small and doesn't have the arm length out there to hold up. Um, really, I thought he was snappy in his flip of hips, Brendan. I think all of the movement ability just seems like it translates to its best, um, him kicking inside and him being in there. Um, another guy that just more often than not, it's not going to look back for the ball. Uh, you don't want him in, you know, off coverage moments on the outside. That's when he really had his issues. Brendan, again, he gets kicked to slot. This, this gets mitigated. So a lot of the issues that you did see for me with him on tape, Brendan, I was like, well, once he goes to slot, this won't be a problem. And the good parts of his game, when he does move to slot, will still be highly beneficial. So uh, a guy that I think has actually an ability to round into being kind of a league average slot corner that you end up getting in the fifth round, which would be, that's that's damn good value, Brennan. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right to me. Just another solid slot corner. Yes, sir. All right, next on my list here, and again in the fifth round, I've got about five guys left here, thick fifth round. Mm -hmm. MJ Devonshire out of Pittsburgh. Did you have a chance to take a look at him? Yes, I did. And I think I had him in about this same area. Yes, I did. It's fifth round pick. I like his click and close. I like his longish arms. They're not that long compared to some others, but in this class, they're <laughs> the gargantuan. very long. Yeah. Um, testing numbers overall were about average up and down. 40 was okay. Change of direction is awful, but the jumps are good. Mm -hmm. um, really good production the last two years. Great ball skills. 18 passes defense, seven interceptions. Uh, he's really good at watching the quarterback, uh, watching the quarterback's eyes, moves well in space, has a good press. Um, not a very good tackler, and it doesn't seem like he's really motivated to tackle all that well. A um, little bit on the smaller side, doesn't have the speed to keep up with the faster receivers. I think he's a zone corner in the NFL, but there's nothing wrong with that. But mm -hmm. I think he'll be a ball hawk in zone, and I think he can play inside and outside because he's got the movement skills to play inside and the length to play outside. So fifth round pick. Yeah. I, um, I, I think I'm a little bit more towards thinking he's more man coverage than zone coverage to me. Um, I thought he has an ability to really loose hips, explosiveness, get him up and let him turn and burn, I, especially his zero to 60 to me. Brennan was really impressive. Shorter explosiveness. I, I do agree with you. You can play him on the inside and the outside. Um, he did give up quite a few yards in coverage last year. Not a lot of completions, but whatever completions he gave, there's a lot of yards on the back end of it. I didn't love his run defense. 659th quarterback, cornerback, college cornerback rated by PFF last year. So the, the grades were were really brutal um, across the board with that. So um, I also think he had a hard time with physicality from receivers. Um, they, they were able to fight their way open at times, you know, with a, just a hand shove or whatever, not even illegally, you know, just hand fighting and getting open off the back of it. He does have some ball skills though. Seven interceptions over the past two years. He does get his head turned around. He does, you know, put himself in a position to get it, which again is a pretty great uh, trait to have Brendan versus some of these other guys we've seen in this draft so far. So, um, but the run defense and tackling was in the toilet this year. I just didn't think it was strong. It, it was it was pretty close to miserable from him. But I do like how he moves. I do like the way you can kind of I think put him in man and let him just go. And uh, he might find some might find a home in being able to play that way in the right scheme at the the next level. But boy, does he have to clean up his run defense? Yeah, and that would be a big problem here. So it's hard to be too interested personally. That would be a big issue. I don't think he's uh, landing here. This would not be a targeted spot. My other fifth round guy, this was a late guy for me to my board, didn't test. You may not have had a chance to take a look at him either, which is uh, Roe Torrance out of Arizona yeah, State. He barely did not make my cut. Yeah, I, I, he almost didn't with mine. I was about to give up and I was like, oh, Brennan will probably look at this one. So I figured a Pac-12 kid, I better uh, I better get him checked out here. Uh, another 6'3", 208 guy. Brennan, he's got 34 and one eight one eight inch long arms. So very long arms, um, put together a solid all around season for the sun devils. Uh, they usually put him in press coverage and let him jam and then just trusted he could stay with the receiver and first playing the off coverage stuff. A lot of these other bigger corners, Brennan do, you know, uh, he attacks as a run defender. He supplies a real, a willingness to really take on offensive linemen and really heads up where other cornerbacks just won't do that. He's not going to get thrown around. 
he wasn't actually the rare big cornerback, Brendan, that wasn't comfortable in actually being in off coverage. So a uh, bit of a tough man where it's like, well, you're not going to be able to really flip your hips when you want to play that pressed up at the next level, or maybe you will. Maybe you have that weird part of your skill set that can do it with those long arms, but um, tough tr moving the hips. He's not super fast, um, not super explosive, but did get the job done on the tape I watched of him, Brendan. So I, I put him in the fifth because I thought – I like the fact he was a guy that could be 6'3", play press, and run with some of these guys with some confidence, and then play the run as well as he did. It, it did appeal to me along with those super long arms. Hmm. Okay. Not bad. Uh, next guy on my list here. I don't think I have my notes on this guy. i got to find my other stuff here. Uh, let's go with Kalen King. Okay. This is a very interesting one, right? This is uh... – a lot of interesting things going on here. This guy was a top 10 pick, uh, like, let me Last think. year. Like August? Six months ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it uh, reminds me a little bit of, remember uh, Sean Wade, the Ohio State corner? Mm -hmm. I remember that one year he had, he was building up to, like, first round. He, he was in the first round, and then he fell off the face of the earth very quickly. That's right. No, I yeah. I do remember that, and this one's maybe even more of a startling fall from grace from what he's he's right. had to deal with. So he's got about average size. He's got short arms. Ran a really bad forty four six one. That's brutal. That's hard to get over. Um, his combine in general was bad. Uh, after a season where he had three interceptions and eighteen passes defensed in twenty twenty two, he proceeded to have zero interceptions and two passes defensed last year. And I think he played. Did he, I don't think he missed significant time. No, nope. no, he's out yeah. there going. No, he so was. very prolific ball production in 2022. He's very young still. He's only 21. Most of the guys in this range of the draft are like 23, 24. So he could get better. He's got good smooth transitions from his back pedal to his run when he flips the hips. He's got the awareness and knowledge to get it done in zone. He's a good tackler, physical in coverage. He processes information well. These are all the things I would have said after 2022. Unfortunately, 2023 happened and none of those trades really showed up. He's very slow, clumsy, click and close. It looks very tentative to me. Not very strong. Gives up too much cushion. All these things that worked so well in 2022 have just disappeared. I don't know what happened. Um, all that's left really is a slow, mediocre athlete with mediocre size he feels like he's smart. I feel like he's got brains, but he doesn't have the athleticism to actually act on that football IQ, you know? He does. I it's how do you explain the drop in the tape? I mean, last year he's running the he's running the routes for the receivers and the quick feet, the loose hips, the dexterity, the explosiveness. It's all over the tape. You're watching a lockdown corner last year. The him being a first round pick or being targeted to be that top guy was rightfully so. The tape you know, told you that he went from being a top 10 PFF cornerback last year to now being rated 712th out of 832 rated cornerbacks by PFF last year. And you can't even put it on the back of Brennan saying it's his run defense because his run defense actually came forward this year. Like his tackling isn't great, but his actual instincts and willingness to play the run and, and to try to get off blocks that had been bad in the past that started to actually kind of improve this year. It's his 55, 55.7 coverage grade. The thing you want him to do and uh, what to make of it. I don't know. He's also had a really poor pre-draft process. And I'm not just talking about the testing scores, but when he went out to the Bowl, it didn't get any better. And so you can't lean on that previous year's tape. I've got to lean on what you've done recently. And I put him in the back of this round because man, last year's tape was just so good. If I'm taking a risk on the last end of the fifth round at that point, then so be it. But boy, it's been a uh, starting fall from grace. And one thing I noticed last night is getting prepped for the show. Brendan is, we got three Penn State cornerbacks in this draft. Three draftable Penn State cornerbacks in this draft. What happened? You have two edge rushers in Adisa Isaac and Chop Robinson off the edge to supply you pass rush. Why are all of you underperforming across the board? I don't have an answer for it, but it's something that does strike me is all these guys are physically very talented and they didn't get it done on the football field for that Penn State defense in that secondary last year. You're uh, muted. It, it's a it's a mystery. I... It, it, it is a mystery. 
All right. Well, that was the last of my fifth round, guys. Did you have anybody else in your fifth round? Um, let me see here. Um, Ryan Watts. Did you get a look at Ryan Watts? That was one of mine that I didn't get to. Well, he's very interesting, and I think I can sell you on why he's interesting with two words: uh, thirty-four and a half inch arms. Ooh, there we go. So those numbers here. 6'3", 208 pounds, 34 and a half inch arms, very explosive as well, 40 and a half inch vert, 10 foot 5 inch broad, good change of direction skills. Not a lot of production the last couple of years for Texas, but a moderate amount. Uh, good fighter at the catch point, changes direction and moves fluidly, can play man or zone, capable tackler, not afraid to get involved in run support. Now, he doesn't have the speed to consistently play man coverage, so I would restrict him mostly to zone. Very little ball production in his career, which, given how big he is, you would expect him to have more than six passes defensed over the last two years. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes slips into lackadaisical effort and loses technique for no real reason. It just, I don't know, it's just like he suddenly has a bad rep. Um... So this is another kind of a Tariq Woolen type pickup, right? You've got a guy who's big and long, and that that's interesting. Um, he would have been great in Pete Carroll's defense, and Mike McDonald might also be intrigued by this level of potential. So slap a fifth-round grade on him for me. I put a fifth-rounder. Looks like Washington kind of abused him, too. That was really one of his rougher games, it looked like. Mm -hmm. They really went at him with it. But, yeah, I didn't have a chance to watch him too much. He was the last guy on my list I just didn't quite get to. Mm -hmm. I think that's all I had. Okay. Uh, let's turn it over here to the sixth, seventh round for me. I just kind of put everybody in the same spot on this spot. Uh, my first guy I've got on my seventh round board is Daquan Hardy, the Penn, one of those Penn State kids I was talking about. Yes, and I believe I did look at him as well. Let me take a look here and be sure. Oh, I actually had a different uh, Penn State guy. I had Johnny that's Dixon. Dixon. That's those three. I said there, there's three of them, Brendan. There's three guys. Okay, so I did not have Hardy. He he did not make my cut. So uh, Hardy, um, let me get the deal up here for him. Sorry, one sec here. Where is it? Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, maybe I don't have it here. Um, yeah, I got it, Kitty. Sorry, one mm, second. The, the cat ate your homework. She did. I had the guy posted here, and now he's not here. So I'll have to do it the, whole, the old fashioned way. Uh, 5'9, uh, 179 pound corner, Brendan, with 30 inch long arms. This is a slot only kind of cat. Now, he tested really well 4'3'8, 1'5, 10 yard split, almost a 43 inch vertical leap, and a 10'6 broad jump. So the testing numbers were great with him. Uh, this, to me, made three underperforming Nittany Lion corners in this draft. Um, he's a slot corner, but he did play some on the outside, but he's only slot the next level, quick, fast, explosive. Plays with a linebacker's mentality against the run when he stays committed, which is not all the time. Um, doesn't quite run as fast as he was tested at 4.38. He's more like a 4.45, 4.5 guy to me. Um, ranked 544th out of all college cornerbacks by PFF. So, again, another guy very poorly graded. Um, when he checks out of the run, he's clocked out. Um, it's not really complicated with Daquan and coverage, Brendan. He may have the wheels to stay with every receiver, but not the understanding for how to do it. One change of direction, and he's saying, which way did he go? Which way did he go? You know, just can't stay in with it. So he feels really small in the field. He certainly has all the mobility in the world uh, to be a sudden slot receiver in the NFL level, but not a lot of natural feel there. Doesn't play the run at a consistent enough basis to feel like you can really trust him there. Um, I think the testing kind of ends up tricking you a little bit here. Maybe some special teams value, but outside of that, I don't think there's a lot he offers. Moving along, how about Tareeb Still? I did have uh, – is it Tareeb or is it Tarheeb? I wrote down Tarheeb. Potato, <laughs> potato. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the Maryland, right? The Terrapin? That's right. Right, okay. Yeah, so didn't test all that well. Decent size, really short arms, though, like sub 30. Mm -hmm. uh, he played inside and outside at Maryland. Sit five interceptions last year. Cerebral understanding of routes. Sure-handed with a lot of interceptions. Plays the run respectably. He's not going to be able to play outside in the NFL because his arms are so short. The speed means that he can't hold up in man. Probably going to get a lot of flags as well. Tends to be grabby. 
And while he does play the run respectably, he's not a great tackler. So run of the mill slot only corner. I um I was more seventh round UDFA on him. Yeah, I can see that being where he goes to. Um He's got some base slot skills I like. The stop and start, the flip in the hips, the explosion to jump the route when the opportunity presents itself. Don't think he's going to have any chance to play outside, obviously. 29 and 5 eighths inch arms, Brendan. Those are really small arms. You're getting to a point with those inch arms where it's like, okay, you're. it's just to a point you can't. Come on. What are we doing? Um, good, good understanding route concepts. You're not going to trick him easily. Um, he has just enough quickness, I think, for the position as evidenced by his testing numbers. Um you might you might find a guy that can round the slot, but just doesn't have a lot of exceptional physicality there or uh, wheels to make it really stand out. Versus, especially a lot of guys even in this draft, I think it's either a six seven UDFA kind of guys where he probably lands. Continuing, uh, moving on, uh, we've uh, we talked we did Chris Abrams drain right? Did we do that one already? Yeah, we did that one right. Yes, we did. Uh, yes, we did. I remember. Uh, and then, so the next guy I've got on my list is going to be a kid out of uh, Dakota. Dakota. Miles Harden out of South Dakota. 5'11", 195. Another guy beneath 30-inch long arms. Did you have a chance to take a look at him? Man, he did not make my cut. I could have gotten up to like 50 if I really wanted to, couldn't I? I know. Yeah, you could have, man. I did. Look, once you get to 38, you're about done on a positional group. You <clears> about <throat> had enough. Uh, not a lot to be had with this guy. I won't spend a lot of time on him outside corner with T-Rex arms. Um, you're going to have to kick him inside. He does have loose hips, excellent change of direction, a willing tackler that plays slightly bigger than his size. I like that part about him. Got a great timing on the snap count, Brendan, the thing that stood out to him, but this gets neutralized once you move him inside as he was really played games with quarterbacks on when he when he would show you a press look and do that move where you flip the hips and you bail right before the snap, and you really diagnose to a quarterback who might look and say, oh, I've got you up in press. I can hit you with a nine route over the top. And instead, he's hitting into a bail drop technique just as you're at the snap, and he can kind of change your pre-snap read as a quarterback in his timing of the route and getting into sort of a change of what he shows from pre to post snap. Really the one thing that stood out to me, but again, Brandon, it gets neutralized because he has to go into the slot at the next level. Um, he was rarely tested on the outside in the film I watched. I mean, really rarely tested. Playing at South Dakota, though, there's a little bit of the competition thing going on there. And obviously, I don't have endless ray, endless runs of South Dakota State to call upon. Um, but I thought in the si seventh round, as a guy that you know maybe can just have a nice feel for how to play and has the hips and has kind of some of the, even though he didn't test great, I think has some of the natural ability in there. Maybe you take a run on him in the seventh round, but could be a UDFA guy too. Okay. And then we Not got bad. the uh, other Penn St under underperforming Penn State corner here, and uh, the guy that you did look at, which would be the other outside corner on that Penn State defense, Johnny Dixon. Yeah, these are the shortest arms yet. I think Thir twenty nine and a half. We've had one of those about right there. I think that, yeah. that we've had a couple of those guys. Um, I will say he is the best blitzer at corner in this draft. Ooh. Seven and a half sacks over the last two years. He almost had as many sacks as Chop Robinson over the last two years. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, twitchy movement skills, yeah. explosive, aware enough to do well in zone, and he's got the short area quickness to hang okay in man. His long speed is pretty good, but um, he's small, and the short arms are definitely going to force him inside, does a lot of grabbing and holding. He's going to get flagged in the NFL. Physically, he's weak and doesn't really tackle. He's too small, too weak. Can't wrap up because his arms are tiny. So decent enough athlete. I could see like a sixth or seventh round pick on him for the things that he is good at, but it, it's not interesting until then. Yeah, I think 20 years ago, this kid finds more of a footing versus the modern designs and the modern necessities of what you have to bring to the, the position. It's old school. You put him in press coverage, let him just stay glued to guys, and he'd probably be okay you know, in that way. Um, but now in this day and age, you need guys at the corner position that can run defend and can do more than just try to run and run with guys and be at being a bit of an undersized size because there's bigger receivers that are just going to beat you with contested catch situations. Um, he's not comfortable in off coverage at all. 539th rated cornerback by PFF last year. All of those Penn State cornerbacks, Brennan, what the hell happened? Um, not with, I don't think he has any notable ball skills, doesn't tackle. Just kind of a toolsy, slightly undersized project is my bottom line. Yeah. Last guy I have on my list is a guy that the, was announced the Seahawks actually met with. 
which is mm -hmm. interesting. Um, not a huge fan of this guy's game either. Another guy that I do see as an as a uh, undrafted uh, rookie free agent type, Carlton Johnson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I put Carlton in my sixth round just because I like the ball skills, okay. but he's certainly small, short arms. Um, I like his uh, click and close. I think he's a pretty decent athlete. Change of direction skills, but he's just small and probably can't do he's going to be slot only in the nfl not comfortable when he's far away from the line of scrimmage tackling's not good not particularly willing to tackle either so not really a fit for what we're trying to do here so sixth round and not even that here yeah i i think you're right there's some ball hawk kind of stuff going on with him you know there's some certainly ball skills four picks last year eight and three years he's willing to go up and pluck it brendan um there is some quickness and change of direction to his game the the arm length is short, like you say, so he's got to go into the slot, which is going to be weird because he played so much off coverage as an outside corner as an undersized guy. So when you get him into the slot, he is going to be in a bit of a territory that's not normal to him or understood. Uh, 548 yards given up in coverage last year, Brendan, at Fresno State, where he's not exactly getting faced with, you know, Malik Neighbors this week and uh, Marvin Harrison next week, right? So... You know, you go, what happened there with the coverage? And certainly playing on the outside and being short arm is going to hurt him there with being undersized. 173 pounds, too, in addition to that. Just very, 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 very small. I think he probably goes UDFA, but maybe Seattle does a – I think that's probably why they're mean with him. It's like, we'll go UDFA, and we're trying to sell you on the place a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well, that was all I had on, uh, on my uh, list of guys here. Yeah, I got a little bit. I did look at a Willie Drew of Virginia State. He, uh, Virginia State, not Virginia. That's the Virginia State Trojans. I think they're a, I, I, I know this guy played for an HBCU as well. So he's one of the, uh, every year the NFL talks about their HBCU guys. And mm -hmm. It's fun to see if one will get drafted or not. It's mm -hmm. like a bet you can make over under 0 0.5 HBCU players. Um, <laughs> 34 passes defensed over the last two Ooh. years, including yeah. 11 interceptions. So the ball skills will translate. Some of it won't, but he's got legitimate ball skills. He's got decent length, 32 inch arms, six feet tall. Uh, change of direction and burst is good. He's really good in press. Uh, he is segmented on his um, flipping hips, hesitant on his click and close, obviously playing very weak competition. Not going to do much in run support, but there's something on here. There's something here. When you have ball skills like that, you'll probably be able to do something. Well, and I, that when you get under that one five on the ten yard split too, Brandon. I mean, that's to me, that's just a territory that's kind of a different. Even in in NFL places where everyone's fast at one five nine, one four nine, you're getting in that place. You're in a kind of a special area and an area where you know that's what allows you to make that jump on those balls and make the you know i haven't seen his game but that would be something that just stood out to me is that you got that short area burst that's what can get you to the, being able to make those picks that other players can't get to on time yeah and one other guy i want to briefly mention here would be actually a guy we met with as well um the argonaut quantez stiggers quantez stiggers that's a great did not, one. did not play any college football Played one year with Toronto, had five interceptions. Uh, the testing numbers are pretty decent: four, four, nine, one, five, two, ten yard split. Uh, ten foot eight inch broad, which is really nice. Decent size, six feet tall, two hundred four pounds, thirty and a half inch arms. Good in zone. Good at reading the play when he's watching it develop in zone. His trigger downhill, his click and close is good. Great ball skills. Should be able to play outside in the NFL as long as he can overcome his arm length, which admittedly they're pretty short. Um, probably going to draw a lot of flags in the NFL. Doesn't have upper level NFL speed, not equipped to play press man. And it's just hard, right? He played one year in the CFL. That's all I have. There's <laughs> there, it, that, that's tough. You're yeah. asking a lot to evaluate that one. So seventh round, it would be okay. I guess. I understand. I think the ball skills are legit. Seventh rounds worth taking the flyers, man. Sixth round to me is worth taking the flyers at that point. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, that is where, though I will say it was interesting to John that though they live, they live so heartily, Brendan, in that value-based mindset now in recent drafts that he has said that they are willing in the later rounds to go more for the need, which would take you away a little bit less, you'd think, from what you think I, 
like we're talking about here, where oh, we'll go to the projects in the sixth, seventh round because it's like, what do you expect to get there anyway? And it sounds like they go a little bit different with it on their approach with trying to find a little more certainty in that spot. Mm -hmm. All right, and that's all I got. So those are your corners, folks. Nearly 40-odd corners between the two of us for you guys to take a look at. This is a deep draft, and, and hopefully you can understand why we do think with all of these corners into it that you know, you're know you sitting – just think of it from John Schneider's perspective, even if we're not drafting early, is that you're in the fifth round. You've got a corner with a third-round grade on the board versus – uh, an edge that's a fifth round grade or, you know, a guard that's a fifth round grade, you know, where do you get driven to if you're having value drive you in the mindset? And I think that that's what takes you to cornerback much like it could take us to receiver where it's just too good a value of the guy you have on the board available to you versus the other positions. And that's why it's, you can't just throw it away and say, there's no chance that they take that or, or go down that road. I am ready for anything. When it comes to anything can happen, I'm man. Just about anything. ready. I mean, a left tackle would surprise me, right? That's the one that I would have a hard time understanding. But other than that, I'm I'm ready to go with BPA pretty much down the line. Uh, so me as if BPA is the corner, then BPA is a corner. That's right. Me, me as well. Um, I don't want to talk long on this last little thing. I think it's something we should cover just because it got brought up in the chat, and I just want to make sure that I'm putting my work record on this. A lot of people are making the big deal today, even nationally and like Eisen and some people on the shows about the, the taking down the pictures in the, in the building. Okay. I don't want, I don't want to go too far on this, Brendan. I know we've got three hours on the show, but mm -hmm. um, not a big deal from my standpoint. You want to create your own new regime, your own mm -hmm. new energy. It doesn't mean you're not honoring the old, but I feel like the old loomed over the top of this organization with a pretty large shadow that you had to make sure that you kind of negated walking the door for your Mike McDonald. Yeah, some of the players have even talked about how, you know, we got to let that stuff go. Like, I think Marshawn Lynch was like, I'm surprised with how obsessed this place still is about 2013 when he was here in 2019. Yeah. He was like, build new stuff. So, no, I yeah. got no problem with it. I do too. And it doesn't mean you're not still honoring those old players. It just means that you're trying to create the new legacy. So. Mm -hmm. Well, we are almost through the end of this, folks. We are all inside a week away from the draft. Me and Brendan have one more BNB show that we're going to do on the safeties next Tuesday. So strap in for that. We will be back. And you're going to get a lot of BNB. Actually, you're going to get four BNB shows next week. So we'll be on Tuesday. We're going to be doing all days of the draft. We'll be doing a BBNB show after the draft. So uh, do prepare yourselves. Tune on in. Both me and Brendan will be doing our own uh, live streams on the day of the draft. You can watch both at the same time, man. Just get those going in. Get those locked in. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. We've been prepping up for this for a couple of months, for a year now for this draft. So uh, I know he's excited. I'm excited to see how this is going to break down. It's very unpredictable. The Hawks could go in a variety of different ways. New coaching staff, John being able to just run it full and true, whichever way he sees fit. So uh, hopefully it'll be a real exciting draft for us and uh, you guys as well. But uh, thank you, Brendan, for doing all this coverage with me. I've had a, a hell of a time breaking down mm -hmm. these players with you. It's been That's awesome. Right. It'll be a great draft, brother. We'll uh, we'll knock this thing out of the park as we come through in the next week. So I'm ready for it. Well, do us this favor, folks, if you could. Just a small little favor. Hit that like button on both videos. Doesn't matter what you're watching here. You're watching over on Brendan's side. Also, sub on up Seahawks, Brendan Nelson, and the Hawks Nest both, please. We'll, we'll be covering throughout the offseason and into the year. And we will be back soon on Tuesday, ready to see our Seahawks kick this draft's ass. But until that time, please, by God, don't you ever forget. Never forget now. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.